It is about a minute or two past seven. I'm going to call the meeting to order. Can I have an acceptance of the agenda? So moved. Second. Second by Mr. Harris. All in favor? Aye. 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 It is unanimous. Are there any walk-ins? Mr. Doherty. David Doherty, 122 Gilson Road. Uh, before I tell you why I went, came here really to say, I should mention the fact that my neighbors and I have been disturbed quite a bit in the last few weeks with the windows open and the winds and everything with the wind turbine. But why I'm really here to tell you is that uh, I got notice this morning from Epsilon because I'm the coordinator of all the testing for the owners of the property that they plan on testing early Thursday morning, which is July 11th between the hours of 11, pardon me, 1 a.m. and 4 a.m. in the morning. So uh, we'll see how that goes, but I uh, invite you all to participate in it. There's four different locations. You certainly is enough of you to see how this goes and, uh, and judge for yourself, and I can try and educate you to some of the techniques they're using and why I think that there are issues with the current testing protocols. But uh, I have the four addresses on the sheet of paper and the times to pass, pass out to you. You can just give it to Lorraine. Thanks. Okay. I'm, uh, I don't know why they chose that night, but because it's a south-southwest wind is with the prediction that I see, and that's probably going to be most affect the used road address. It won't get me too bad unless the wind shifts to the southwest. Of course, it'll always get the person who's 661 feet from it. They're the ones that originally went before the planning board back in the vetting process in 2008 with uh, information showing how this was going to impact his home. And uh, apparently it went on deaf ears and now he's one of the people who is calling and I, I don't know how his family lives there with that thing that close. <laughs> I won't mention any names, we all know who it is. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. So, I've been, I've been at your at your house at one in the morning listening in the past so um, I don't know that we're savvy enough technical to to actually grasp what's going on with the testing but uh, I know we'll look at the reports and the results when they come in so well there are certain things like like you think that it's as simple as them shutting the thing off and taking a reading of how quiet it is and turning it on and recording how the loudest noise is but it's not that way what they do is they, they take the loudest noises and they average them and they bring it down, which is not the way the law was written, but over the years they've been doing that is they find these things out of compliance. It's one of these things I've been trying to, to lobby the state and nobody wants to listen to me and the DDP doesn't want to give me audience to discuss this with them. I'm technical people, I have registered acousticians in the business who want to discuss this with the state and the state won't listen to it. There's a lot of politics behind these things. And again, I'm not against them. I think it's a fine idea. I just, when they put too close to home, that's the problem. Yeah. So we'll, they'll come and report to us and tell us what they did and we'll move forward. And I'm glad that at least they're doing the testing. So, um, any other walk ins? Great. Seeing none, we'll move to the uh, report of the town administrator. Good evening. Uh, first up, the July 4th holiday in Hamarok on July 3rd. Five people were taken into protective custody. July 4th, we had one arrest for disorderly conduct and one minor transported to South Shore Hospital for alcohol. So I think all in all, it was a successful 4th of July holiday weekend. Uh, Chief Stewart and Deputy Thompson are preparing a more in-depth report, and I'll make that available to you when I got it. But I think the change in the policy really didn't have a whole lot of impact on policing action down in Humrock, so that's a good thing. Uh, Cedar Point, Woodward and Covered in the engineering firm that we selected for the additional saw work at uh, the study at Cedar Point. We'll be conducting smoke test investigations. That is currently scheduled for the, uh, July 18th, 19th, and 22nd. Cool they put a white <coughs> smoke uh, into the source system, and then they look to see where it's coming out to try to find leaks, and if they're actually it's coming out in the houses. The notifications will go out to the residents tomorrow. Uh, so right is now, is that a weekend? What what days? Uh, the 18th and 19th is not. 22nd, I don't believe is. I know the 18th must be a Monday. Yeah, it's a Thursday, Friday, Monday. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so that's the first step in that study that we authorize on Cedar Point. Uh, water. Uh, very quickly, I'm going to do a very high-end water update. Uh, we will have the water department in at our next meeting after they've had time to analyze all the data from the weekend. Uh, but 
for the July 4th weekend, we had 109 reports of brown or discolored water. That is down significantly from last year. Uh, we spent a lot of time, as you're aware, down on second and third cliffs. Those are usually problem areas for us. We had no complaints from second cliff. We only had a couple from third cliff. Um, the area bordered by Tilden Road, Hadley, and the Proving Grounds, that kind of triangle is a notoriously bad area for us. Uh, this year we had no reports from that area. Uh, again, no reports doesn't mean there weren't any brown water, but uh, we do take it as a good sign that we didn't get any reports from down there. It seems that the areas we got a lot of complaints about and we have a map on the wall people can look at uh, seem to be in smaller neighborhoods uh, where the lines are not looped. So we don't have a good flushing program in there. Uh, we went into those. The water department has gotten those reports. Um, special shout out to Mark Cloud. He's our new assistant water superintendent. He's been the one chasing these down and dealing with the people. Uh, when they're getting those reports, they're going out, they're cracking their hydrants, they're doing what's called a trickle flow. Uh, to do a full flush just stirs up the whole area, so they're doing a trickle flow. Uh, I know some of you got uh, emails from a woman on Hilltop. Uh, we went out and looked at that, and that neighborhood is almost like an A-shaped with a cross piece. The water comes in one leg of the A, loops around, and then goes across the T, and she's down this leg, which is just a dead end. Uh, so we flushed that. The water department actually went back out there today took her meter off, flushed her line. Uh, she sent a very nice email thanking us. But that's a lot of the issues that we were running into when you look at that is, is those, I don't want to say isolated neighborhoods, but neighborhoods that don't have uh, a loop water system. So the water goes up there and just stays up there. It's very hard for us to flush. Uh, down in uh, Michelle's neighborhood, uh, there's all cul-de-sacs off there. That's Situate down there. All the cul-de-sacs off there. None of those cul-de-sacs have hydrants on the end. So the water just goes up and it sits. So is that just, may I ask a question? I'm sorry. Are you done? <laughs> Did you ask? Yeah. Oh. Is that just indicative of the time in which those developments were built and what the engineering was at that time? or is It, it was indicative of, of when they were built and what the planning board requirements were. Yeah. So the planning board requirements said a hydrant every X number of hundreds of feet. So if it was a hydrant every 500 feet and the last hydrant was 400 feet from the end of the cul-de-sac, they didn't put another hydrant at the end of the cul-de-sac. Uh, now Kevin requires that those lines be looped. You can't just put in a dead end water line. Uh, so it either has to go through to some place or they got to bring the water line back out and have a water line go up and come back to loop it out so we can flush those lines out. So I think we made some progress. Uh, it's not good enough. Uh, the guys are still out there working. Uh, we had some down on First Parish which surprised us. And then we found we had a water main break down there that was causing a lot of turbidity down in that area. So we got that fixed today. Uh, but the water department is really, really doing a good job going out and, and calling people back, chasing people down, uh, and trying to get out there and clear these <coughs> out. And um, Kevin and I actually spent yesterday morning and this morning, uh, the two of us going out, meeting with people, seeing what was going on, finding out what was happening, and then getting the crews out there to, uh, to fix it. So, uh, so I think it's, it's better. Yeah, so a, a couple things. We, we knew, we sent out an email a couple days before the 4th. This was going to be the worst weekend. Right, all the all the people came into town. The weather was beautiful, um, and the, probably the volume of water was off the charts. So that stirs everything up at the beginning of summer, and typically is the worst time for brown water. Um, I just um, implore everybody to please, if you're getting brown water, and there's not a, a noticeable reason why, you have to call the water department and let us know, because that data is very important in terms of where we attack problems in the future. And in some cases, if it's, if it's happening time and time again, the water department can go out there and flush that area. So they can do things that may be able to help your area. I, I hear people complaining about it, that their wa water was black or brown or whatever color for a long period of time. If you have, for 10 days, if you have brown water, you've got to tell us, because there are things that the water department can do to help you um, get through this quicker. Right, Kevin? True, and, and you know, it could be future planning. Right. We, we may, you know, push that area to be replaced sooner than later. Um, pig other, those lines, we could. Pig those lines, yeah. do some ice pigging. The other thing that we've been doing, and some people are, you know, concerned about it, or questioning is, we'll leave a hydrant, as, as Jim said, trickling, and that relieves the brown water, so the brown water is coming out of the hydrant as opposed to the house. Right. And, and it might help alleviate the problem. Right. Um, but we're pulling every, every trick we can out of the bag to, to right. try to help. So please tell us. We need the data, and we need to, you know, get 
some of the resources to help you because no one wants anybody to have brown water. You know, we all have it too, and no one, no one likes it. Um, one of the problem area has always been Front Street. Uh, no complaints from Front Street this holiday. So right. uh, water usage went from right around a million the weekend before the holiday to between 2.4 and 2.5 million gallons a day over the holiday weekend. So that's one and a half times. That's a just so thing. everyone heard that because you didn't. Yeah. So we usually use a million gallons on a weekend, and this weekend we use 2.4 or 2.5 million gallons. So this is just what happens this time of year, and as we've you know explained a thousand times. When the volume picks up, it stirs up all the water in the pipes, and all that brown stuff that's settled to the bottom becomes like dust in the water, and it gets it gets into the lines, and it gets to people's houses. So, um, any other water comments? Yeah, I just want to say to people that complaining on Facebook is not enough. <laughs> it isn't right. Um, if you have a problem, please tell us. Um, not all of us read Facebook. <laughs> I read it. I don't comment on it, but I do read it. But, you know, you have to tell the town officials if you've got a problem like this, and it's not adequate to complain on Facebook. Yeah, so We don't govern the town by Facebook posts. A um, couple of questions. Just do you, do you happen to know what the, you said that they were significantly down. Do you happen to know the number of complaints we got last year? I know it's a lot less, but. It, it was an order of several times more. Seven times. That's several right. times. Several times. Okay. Yes. Um, and. Um, I, I did speak to the, the woman from Hilltop, and I have to just say that that's exactly why you need to report, is her problem had nothing to do with the volume. It had to do with a systemic problem in the system that they're able to address, and that's terrific. Um, and she did write a very nice thing. She said she felt like a kid in Christmas, on Christmas morning when she woke up and she had clean water, so kudos to the water department. Um, just one question. The, some of the residents in Hummerock, back to Hummerock, were a little concerned about opening the beach. Did um, was everyone comfortable once they I saw the diligence of the police? Haven't received any complaints or or anything from Hummerock at all. Okay, great. Thank you, sir. So the one thing I did want to mention at Hummerock that a few people did try and have bonfires, um, and oh. I think Jim said that the police put out four or five bonfires where people stacked pallets and on pallets again and tried to go back to the days of when it was crazy out there. So. I'm glad there was a complete yeah, presence. Yeah, fire department right out, put those right out. Yeah, and yeah. put them out right away. So, yeah, Sean. <coughs> I had heard that there was a water problem at the ice plant on Driftway, the private ice plant. I mean, that's not a dead end loop. Someone got a bag of ice for a party. It was all brown. So, and they bought it. So, hmm. I mean, they bought it. Uh, we had plenty of water this spring. We flushed the in front of the river shed. Yeah. Uh -huh. Lorraine, I don't know about you, and I just you live with it. It's been my house. Yeah. I can't see that from <laughs> here. My address is right up here. Yeah, well, yeah. It was clear Yeah, mine's gotten worse. <laughs> but it's just you know, that could have been caused, Sean, by the water. You know, I don't know. It, it could have been usage. It, you know, there's no telling why there are. We, we recorded everything up there. Um, right. We're tracking it. We're trying to figure out why those hits occurred. Um, and we're doing, we're trying some other things with the plant over the next couple nights. We're gonna, we've been running the plant a lot slower. We're spending more, we're running the plant longer, but we're running at a much slower rate. Over the next couple nights, we're gonna run it, we're gonna be in it 24 hours and try to just see how, how that affects the system if we're not shutting it off and starting the plant up again. Um, we're, we're looking at all options. Um, why that had brown water, I'm, I'm not sure, but it's something we can look into. Um, I had heard a I had heard a similar story about somebody saying they had brown ice, but I, had, I haven't seen anything. On it. Right, and I just found out today about it. This happened over the weekend, but uh, so we've done a th how many like 22 miles? That represents what? How many? A third, a quarter, and we're just yeah, going to have 110 to 120 miles of pipe, and um, we have approximately you know, 23 miles we, at the end of this project that we're doing on Ocean Side Drive. Right. And Man Lot Road will have hit probably about 23 miles of pipe. 25 percent. And we've taken out a lot of pipe. Some streets, um, we have two pipes going down the street. Right. Like we, we said, um, Kent Street. Parts of Kent Street had a pipe from 1901 and then a better pipe from 1955. <laughs> and we're deactivating the 1901 pipe. Putting everything to a better pipe from 1955. All right. Okay. 
Thanks. A 75 year old pipe. Much better. <laughs> Uh, last uh, last update for today, uh, high school field project has commenced. So if you go over there, the stadium field is gone. It's been, the turf's been taken up. They ground up the track today. The bleachers are going out, and they have two crews working on the other two fields doing the earthwork. So uh, they're going great guns. The stadium field is scheduled to be returned to us, the track and that field, for the Thanksgiving Day game <coughs> next year. Great. Any questions for Jim? The one thing I, I was going to um, just mention is, and I mentioned to Jim, years ago we used to have like a kind of a, a hot list of topics that we wanted Jim to comment on every meeting. So what I'd like you guys to do is send a list to me of topics that you would like to have Jim comment on. And in his report he can say, yep, now the field has the turf down or whatever the, whatever the four or five, you know, hot topics that we want to find out of are. Maybe the wind turbine. <laughs> I know what you're going to say. <laughs> yes. I didn't want to complain because I figured this guy complained about turbine. Well, I've had brown water for a long time. I didn't want to call in because they say that daddy's just a pain in the neck. But I suspect there are a lot of people like me who don't bother to call in. I'm glad that you said this if they to call in, but now I will. You have to. Yeah. It's like the wind turbine. I know people that don't complain, but it does affect them. You right. Know, for the silent majority or minority, whatever you want to call it. Right. And it, like Kevin said, it will affect future projects. Sure. If all of a sudden we see Gilson, everyone on Gilson is saying there's brown water, then we'll pick that area in our next project. So. Yeah, well, Gilson, we know, is an issue because years ago there was a water main break there. They took out the piece of pipe and they never connected it, so it doesn't loop. <laughs> so we know that we need to go in and, and loop that line. It's just replacing all that pipe gets it's very expensive right, the so other thing I'll say anecdotally is uh, it seemed like when I was reviewing the list of complaints that Kevin got um, last year they were it was black gross smelly uh, this year seemed to be a lot more tea colored tan colored um, not to the same extent again that's just anecdotal for me looking at it uh, they really need to crunch the numbers and, and they'll come in in two weeks and give you a real good update on what uh, what's going on okay, okay. <coughs> yes ma'am just your name and address to start now Yeah, you're not complaining. You're just <laughs> reporting. Yeah, reporting. I just assume it happens that time of year and it goes away, yeah. but it is an issue. It does happen. This weekend, I would, I would be surprised if, <laughs> if the majority of the population didn't have tea-colored water at some point this weekend. <laughs> like we just said, the volume went from a million gallons to two and a half million gallons. Yeah, so, yeah, okay. I was going to say, Dan, we'll, we'll be on that road soon. We'll be replacing the pipes. Yeah, no, yes. Yeah. So. Okay. <laughs> Look at that. You come to a meeting, you announce it, we fix your pipe. <laughs> okay. Moving right along, at 715 we have an update on our sister city project, Susie en Brie. Patrice Chakar, the chair, is here somewhere. very happy to present this report this evening um, about the sister city the situate Susie sister city committee which is under <coughs> the umbrella of as is the Irish um, uh, West Cork I mean the situate West Cork committee of the situate sister city project um, and um, we we're here tonight to talk about our most recent wonderful activity that we had to a visit to Susie Ambry. And this is Lynn Ferreira, who's with Hello. me. Hello. She's one of the people that um, went with us, that joined the group. And she's also hosted many um, students, um, both through the high school exchange and the summer program, the, the um, Séjour Linguistique. And I'll just mention one little speck about that. Um, tomorrow, there are 14 students and two chaperones arriving from Sucy oh, really? to um, take part in the, we have every two years, we have this Séjour Linguistique, which is an English language immersion program 
for students th um, from several different schools, in high schools in the Susi Ambri area, and um, who don't have a, the opportunity of coming during the school year. Either they don't go to Christophe Colomb High School that does the exchange, or they just you know can't come. And they are spending two weeks here, hosted by um, situate families and surrounding area, and. Um, they uh, will be here for two weeks. They'll take classes in the morning, English classes, and then um, engage in cultural activities and summer um, rowing and Cohasset and um, doing some boating and swimming and things like that. But um, anyway, we just want to you know, promote that a little bit that every two years we're looking for families to host and people do step up and Lynn is actually hosting two boys um, this summer so mm -hmm. very we're very grateful to, for, uh, to her so what I'm going to do is show just quickly a little slideshow that goes rather um, quickly and then I'll comment afterwards but you're going to see um, the the, some pictures, photos of the two weeks that we spent in Sioux C, starting um, at the beginning when we first arrived, you'll see um, the arrival picture, and then um, uh, a, a Sioux C Market, and then some scenes in Paris um, of famous sites, which I'll talk about, then our trip to Burgundy, um, and um, back in Paris for a farewell. So, put this on. Do you want me to read this letter? But why did, did you go recently? Oh, right. Okay, yes. We um, did. So I'm going to just let, well, do you want, I'll just show it and then you can read the letter. Okay, go ahead. Okay. Yep. All right, so we're going to start <coughs> and play. Most of you know that gentleman. Yeah, so say he looks familiar from last, so, yeah. last visit. Mm -hmm. That's oh, terrible. terrible. Those are teachers that participated in the high school exchange. Chagall, the ceiling of the opera in Paris. Oh. This is now in Burgundy. Yeah, feel free to. Whereabouts is that, Pat? In Burgundy. All right. And uh, yeah, so I'll, that's at the. We stayed at a guest house there, and that was our pet, <laughs> Leon. His name is. And then we're out in the vineyards in Burgundy in the area that we were in. I'll talk a little more about that. Is that the whole group? Yeah, it is. Another picture at our uh, Lynn's, what was that? <laughs> oh, it's probably the connection. There you go. Yes, that barrel making, culinary class. That's our chef. <laughs> Did you bring samples? Yeah. Uh, sorry, we <laughs> ate them all. <laughs> That's duck, Marguerite de Canard. This is the dessert. This is our one gentleman on the trip. He's great. Oh, he's he's so <laughs> Look at that. I'll talk about that a little bit later. I'm hungry. <laughs> Wine tasting, of course. I'm glad I ate before I got here. And this, uh, I just have one picture, but it's uh, called the Atelier des Lumières. And that was a Van Gogh exhibit. I'll talk about that. That's and that's the last one of our fa farewell party. Okay. So I'll just leave that in there. And um, 
so I'll have you read it at the end. So this year we organized, it was the Situate Sister City Committee, our third adult exchange with Susiambri, which is a town located, as many of you know, just about 12 miles southeast of Paris. And the first um, adult exchange we did was in 2012, 2013, only a few years after we had become a sister city with um, Susie Anne Marie. And this one was composed of mostly um, retired citizens from both towns, but not all of them were. And um, there were 15, 16, I think, several couples and um, then individual people. And it was called the um, named by the French folks, but the L'été Indien, which means Indian summer. And that was supposed to refer to the time they were coming and the age of the people that were <laughs> on the exchange. Um, the second one, 2015, 2016, was an artist exchange, very successful. And then this year was just titled the Adult Exchange. And there were 15 of us, and four uh, of us were repeats from previous and the rest were people from the area and a few towns farther away from one woman from Lexington and a woman from um, Westwood who have participated, come down just through advertising and uh, whatnot to our film festival, um, several of them, and we had a big Bastille Day celebration last year, um, 14 juillet, um, at a home, and these people came, and um, so, we're getting more interest from outside of um, just um, situate, but also our surrounding towns. And um, in all three of these adult exchange, uh, exchanges, the participants were hosted by families in Susi Ambri. Younger families, families with little kids, um, retired people that don't have any children at home, uh, just a variety of, of people. And the, uh, the repeats, were hosted by the same families that hosted them before, which was really nice and um, delightful. Um, so uh, the age group of our group this time was uh, 56 to 80 years of age, but a dynamic, curious, enthusiastic um, group that bonded well together and um, had a good pace for visiting around, no problems, et cetera, and um, they were a delight to travel with. And in the months leading up to our trip, which we always do, we had you know initiation meetings about the area, but also French classes, um, which um, I held, and then some other members of the committee helped out. And um, some people came to them that well, Lynn was there, and actually dredged up a lot of your <laughs> high school French, right? Yeah, so and I mean, it was amazing. Yeah. Some of these people went, one woman who has never been to France, studied French a long time ago, and she just flourished in the meetings. So it's a good thing, even some who didn't know any French at all, and you don't have to know French to participate, but it just makes, if you can speak a little and um, understand just a little bit, it makes it more interesting. And the same thing for the French who, not all of them knew, you know, English very well, and um, so it there was a little bit of mutual. And then children helped out, and then the guides and all that. So um, we left uh, Logan Airport on May 14th, a night flight, and we arrived the next morning at uh, Charles de Gaulle. Uh, um, it was not a school bus that picked us up. It was a glorious, um, mm -hmm. uh, like Greyhound type bus that picked us up and took us to um, Susi. We were met, the first picture, uh, photo you saw was at the town hall, and that was a mansion formally built, um, you know, quite a long time ago. Um, and th everybody was, the families were all there, um, some council people, and um, they had breakfast waiting for us. And um, then uh, we, um, th they were back with their families to rest and, and whatnot. And then the next two days, we visited um, Paris all day long. And on all of our, except for going to Burgundy, there was either one or two, there were one or two host, you know, parents that came with us, also committee members. Um, Cédric Musso did not come, but his wife came with us. And um, 
just think because people are so interested in learning more about us and, and they'd heard so much about Situate, we're on their website over there. And, um, you know, so it was just delightful. And so the two days we were in Paris, we saw some of, the, we took the RER in, which is like the commuter rail and the metro to get around and i have to say um i think you'd agree very mm -hmm. comfortable oh, lovely punctual mm -hmm. um running smoothly etc so i mean we we got around so easily when we were in there and we visited the ile de la cité which you saw notre dame it's the island in the middle of the seine and um we um, also, before just seeing that, you couldn't visit it at all, but we saw it from the Latin Quarter on the other side of the Seine. Um, we were at the, um, uh, the one of the oldest um, Gothic architecture um, buildings, which is La Sainte-Chapelle, and you saw several of the stained glass windows in there by Louis the Ninth. And if you listen to the broadcast of um, uh, Notre Dame and the burning of the, you know, the collapse of the spire, um, and they were concerned not with that anything was in there, but the crown of thorns um, mm -hmm. there used to be in La Sainte Chapelle by um, the one of the king, this Louis the Ninth, who was king of um, France, who had them brought from the Holy Land there. Um, Anyway, so in Paris, we, we were there, and then we explored the Latin Quarter. We were in Montmartre. You saw one picture there. Um, we um, also um, saw the, as I said, the Opéra, and um, those were the first two days. And then um, oh, shopping, of course, Galerie Lafayette, and some small shops. And then the weekend, we spent with the host families, and they, they, everybody, I think, went to the market, and that was just a small corner of the market. But they, two days a week, they have that market, and um, several people, a friend of mine, bought a beautiful jacket there, and but everything very reasonable, and the food, I mean, was fantastic, and. Um, that Saturday night, so looking around, you see, and then that Saturday night, you saw a chateau there um, that was at nighttime, and there were candles, and that was Vaux le Vicomte, which mm -hmm. is not, it's less than an hour, about 45 minutes, mm -hmm. I think, from um, so you see, and we went there for a candlelight dinner um, that several of the host families came, um, and, but you know, not all of them. And there were some other groups there, and we, we arrived there and we toured the gardens outside, and then we ate, had dinner, toured, toured the chateau, and then had fireworks after that with music. And just a little comment is this. Is no, it's beautiful, and it's no, it's a mini Versailles, and it was built ha, built by the finance minister of Louis the Fourteenth, and um, some other ministers didn't really like him and complained that he was, um, uh, you know, embezzling funds, and he made the mistake of inviting Louis XIV to Vaux-le-Vicomte, and. Um, Voltaire said, so the three architects were, or the main people eventually did Versailles, but it was, Le Vaux was the architect of the building, Le Brun was the painter of the different murals and everything, and Le Nôtre was the uh, gardens. And <laughs> the Voltaire wrote something saying at the um, night, I mean at five o'clock in the afternoon, um, Monsieur Fouquet, Fouquet was king, and at one o'clock the next morning he <laughs> was nothing. And he had, was arrested and sent to um, uh, the prison where he died. But anyway, it was just beautiful um, there. And then um, we went left the next day for um, Burgundy, and we were in the area of Givry, not far from Meursault, which is a, produces a really fa nice white wine. And um, <coughs> we stayed at a guest house, and it's called. Um, a chambre d'hôte, and the woman that runs it was originally lived in Cici en Brie, so she planned our whole itinerary. And you saw, I mean, she was a fantastic cook, mm -hmm. and we had the typical breakfast in the morning there with, um, oh, I can't, we can't even talk about it, but the bread <laughs> and the pastries, etc. And um, and so, and then the visiting the vineyard, and our special town was Bone, which is a medieval town and beautiful uh, hospital there, and it's called Les Hospices de Bonne. 
and medieval with beautiful tile roof and everything. And what was nice, this was the first time we did a leaving of the Paris area. And everybody agreed that um, as much as we love being with our families and going into Paris, it was so nice to go to these small towns and really get a feel for what is not Paris. And, um, and just, you know, our big bus driving through these tiny little streets <laughs> and um, and then staying at that guest house um, was lovely too and uh, and you know everything we did there and so just the culinary class so she arranged the the visits to the vineyards the wine tastings the um, um, the experience with the, it was at a cooking school and um, that dessert was a poached pear pear poached in wine um, infused with uh, mousse au chocolat, and then sitting on one of the specialties of the region is gingerbread, and it was this really light little gingerbread, mm -hmm. and then coated with a a, a wine um, fruit, strawberry I think, a raspberry, yes, raspberry uh, on the outside, yeah. mm -hmm. and um, and then in the duck we had we had I'm getting hungry. <laughs> I know. So I was going. I, I know you don't want to listen to this all night. Sounds wonderful. Anyway. Um, we um, then came back to Paris, and we had one more day, and um, part of the group that had never um, been to Versailles were taken by one of the host um, uh, women, and you, you went? No, I no, went you to didn't the, go. Oh, okay, so, um, the, uh, so th three people went to Versailles, and the other people went in back into Paris, and many went to the um, uh, Musée d'Orsay with the um, you know, beautiful Impressionist art, and three of us went out, took the um, metro out to walk around Roland Garros, which is the stadium for the French Open. And um, we, you could see, it was, it's beautiful. It's sort of like Forest Hills was where the, you know, US Open was. <laughs> and just gorgeous. And we could see players, you know, looking in. We could see them playing and uh, it was very nice. And then in the afternoon, you saw that one painting, Starry Starry Night of Van Gogh. Um, it is, we were in a, like a warehouse and it's called the Studio of Lights. And um, it's dark and it's like, two stories high and you see what they showed 12 paintings and each painting comes on with all these um, what projectors I guess it felt like you were in the painting itself and it, it moved along the wall it was amazing wow. hmm. yeah, it was just fantastic yeah. and then it would just slide away and another one would come out and one of our members had gone to a Klimt exhibit there so if you're ever in Paris you should look and, and see um, go there for seeing something. And then that last photo you saw was a garden party by one of the um, select women in, or councilwomen, um, who came here on a visit, the first adult tour she came on, and, and we had a lovely time there, and the families were all there, their children, they were there too, and um, it doesn't get dark until way late there, so it, it was really lovely. So we uh, we were very sad to leave, and mm -hmm. we and, and we don't know why. I know. <laughs> I keep I keep thinking of Leon a lot. The uh, uh, what do you call it? The peacock. <laughs> we just followed, and then would preen and turn around, and then walk along like a dog would or a mm -hmm. cat. So anyway, another <coughs> special thing about France. But um, anyhow, we um, just I just can't emphasize enough the support that we've had from the town and the, the not only from the government uh, but also from um, the families that have become involved and um, with this you know group that's coming tomorrow the Sejour Linguistique it's a little harder in the summertime to vacations but people have stepped up and two of the boys are staying in the Bates house oh Abigail God. and Rebecca Bates. Really? Isn't that nice? Jill yeah. West is Hosting, and um, so we hope you know that more people will know about the French activities and um, join us this next winter with uh, our film festival, which will also have Irish films and French films. And um, we invite all of you to join our next trip. Great. Yeah, I'm very, oh, and do, do you just want to read? That? Yeah, I'd like to read you a letter that one of our um, ladies that came with us wrote, Pat and committee. 
There is so much to say, there is no doubt in my mind that all you and Cedric have done over the years to create a special friendship between Susie and Situate accounts for the warm, welcoming spirit of our hosts. My family could not have done more for me in spite of their busy lives. All five members, two preteens and one teen, mom and dad, went out of their way to share their days with me. I was a member of their family. I learned so much about their lives and culture. They adjusted their schedules to make sure I was delivered to our meeting place or picked up on time. I felt the warmth and hospitality with all the families as well. Each of our group activities were delightful. They all get a 10 for hospitality. As for our sightseeing, every day in Paris, Burgundy, and Soucy was strategically planned and wonderful. This trip will always have a special place in my memories. Kathy Ford. And I just want to end by saying the trip is not expensive. <coughs> It's, uh, this cost us less than $1,600 for flight and other than souvenirs, everything that we did over there. And it's similar, you know, when the French people come here. So it's, it makes it much more, uh, much easier to, for people with just, you know, with average means to be able to go. Okay? And last but not least, I'd like to present to you um, a gift to be shared um, <laughs> from the Besson family. Um, young I'll hold it. I <laughs> move <laughs> the young boy is taking a gap year um, this winter. His name is Jules, and he stayed with Pat and myself different weeks for about 10 weeks. And uh, he was we thought he was, excuse me, can I just say, I yeah. thought he was coming for two weeks. Two weeks. It ended up. And he was three months. I mean, <laughs> ten. But he was fun. And and he was fortunate to go to Situate High School and play on the rugby team. He made friends. I took him to the um, the St. Patrick's Day parade, and all the boys and girls up on the football float all yelled, "Jewel, Jewel!" They all made friends with him, and he had a wonderful experience. And his parents were so grateful that we hosted him, and that our town welcomed him with open arms. Really, it made all the difference in his life. So, thank you. The, so, this model that you're receiving is the, the dad of Julo works. Um, if with the Senate and the French the Senate, French Senate. Oh. and um, it's in a palace uh, in the Luxembourg Gardens and um, he uh, was in charge of all the restaurants and um, all the uh, food that comes in and he's a chef himself mm -hmm. and this is made for um, the Assemblée Nationale, which is the National Assembly, the representatives. So, enjoy. Thank you very much. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Okay. Great. Any, I mean, you did a great job giving, I, all I can say is I just got back from West Cork um, a couple of weeks ago, I think. Um, and the relationships and the bonding and the, the, the uh, sharing of culture is unbelievable. And everyone is so gracious and so um, warm and, and, and giving. It's, and it's, I sense you guys had the same relationship yes. that we did there. And, yep. and I know everyone that's come here has felt the same way, the way that our community treats them as well. So I think it's a great program, both of them. Um, and I think if you're interested in, in learning about other cultures and, and teaching people about ours, get involved. Yes. Well, it's a great opportunity for people. And so I, I might say that the um, we need more members to our, for the French committee, um, and also the Situate Sister City project. Anyone can join, and um, you can just look up my name, and I, I can um, give you a, e email me and it's p dot at comcast dot net. And if you want to become a member, you'll get you know something about every activity that is put on by both the Irish and the French and you're in, the, the input of the t we're interested in you know even things that we haven't thought of doing that people might have you know be able to help out and also suggest to us Great. so thank you Tony. thank you both very much thank, thank you. you I'll leave this one for rain I call third Can I just ask one question? <laughs> yes, ma'am. Sure. Do we have a schedule of what's happening when they come this week? So uh, yes, one I of us. It. Okay. Uh, yes, I will. Okay, um, please. That they come tomorrow night. So somebody can welcome them, them or. To, um, Lorraine, Lorraine yes. that'd be yes. great. Yeah. Thank you. It's just the children and some chaperones, right? Yeah, two chaperones Still. and yeah. uh, one actually is uh, I just met her on the trip. She's a uh, new teacher at the Lycée Christophe Colomb. And she's and some other colleagues are taking over for the teachers that have you saw the teachers on the 
um, picture there, but they have a photo. They're um, not coming. Um, those are have you know kind of handed over the baton to um, um, this woman and some other teachers. So great. She, um, it'll be great. You know, she find out more things. And so maybe when you see the. You're welcome to come to some of our Yeah, well, look, so. Lorraine will tell us what the events yeah, are. Good. Sean, Thank did you? you? Thank you. Sorry. Thank you. Okay, moving right along, we have uh, the discussion of the vote for some outdoor entertainment permits. Um, the first one on the list is 114 Tilden Road, Peter Kelly Detweiler. Peter, how are you? I'm well, thank you. Good. Well? Yourselves? Mm -hmm. right. So we'll move from the exotic Palo Susie Ombre to <laughs> the rivers and swamps and bogs of southeast Massachusetts. So we finished up our 72-mile fundraising canoe trip for the North and South Rivers Watershed Association. This is the fifth one in the last nine years. Um, and they're all fundraisers. We typically raise around $10,000 a year wow. and then follow up with a party to celebrate the fact that we survived it. <clears throat> and I'll note that NSRWA has a really great relationship with Situate. The project to raise the reservoir is just one of many things. We work with a whole lot of towns, um, and I would say that Situate is clearly one of the leading towns in terms of foresight, thinking about the water, um, and how to work with us in protecting the water. And our mandate is, is to do that across the whole South Shore. So what I'm requesting uh, tonight is a party permit at 114 Tilden on the 27th of July. All the neighbors and abutters have been notified. Um, some of them personally, all of them by letter as well. And uh, it's the same band we had two years ago, the Johnny Ray band. The party is scheduled from 7 to 11. You're all invited. I guarantee you that if you come, you must bring your dancing shoes. Otherwise, it's not worth showing up. Uh, there's some plenty of fighting in the field, and um, we, we will be serving. You know, we'll have a keg, and we get, have wine and other things. But we pay attention to what's going on, have a, out, have a tent, and also... Um, Porta potties and that sort of thing. This is our, I think, fifth party, so we know how to do it. <laughs> Great. Are there any butters here? Uh, Seeing none. Questions from the board? Nope. No, but can you just give two seconds so they appreciate what you did when you got on that? Can did you take a kayak or a canoe? A canoe, yeah. A canoe. Yeah, so we jump, in, yeah. we jump in in the driftway and we head up the North River, and the first 10 miles is easy until we get to the Stone Bridge, you know, right, Route 53. And then it gets kind of crazy because um, you go into these braided channels. You know where the Herringbrook is, um, Route 14, where Pembroke? the Herring Run is? Pembroke. Yeah, in Pembroke. We actually pull out there um, for day one. And this year, because it was early June, there were lots of dead herring still in the river. And when my wife drove us home that night, she said, wow, you guys reek. Because <laughs> we're in water up to our waist pushing the canoes. <laughs> And there's dead fish all around. So you're all welcome to join us. <laughs> and the next day we jump in, we drop into um, Stetson Pond, and then we go through a swamp that's so thick that you have to drop leaves into the water to see which direction the current's flowing. And you can find where we cut two years ago, because we do it every second year. I generally do it with my friends from rowing from the 80s, because they're the only people stupid enough to want to do it. And then there's sons, because the DNA passes down to the <laughs> next gene pool. Um, and then we end up in the ultimately you get through a bunch of swamps and bogs, you get to the headwaters, the Setucket River, then the Town River and the Damascus River join, and ultimately the last day is about 40 miles of, of paddling, and then you end up down at Titan Rock, um, just shy of Fall River. So <laughs> it's the old Indian Wampanoag passage that they would have used to haul goods. Running would have been much faster for just normal communications, but moving stuff was done by water. Interesting. I didn't know and you we did that it far. As kids, you know, in 66, <laughs> my Boy Scout troop leader rediscovered that route. So the last time I had done it was 1978, and then you know started it all over again. Yeah. How many people did it? We did. Uh, we had three canoes, six people. Oh, right. yeah. Wow. Yeah. Great. So Any you questions to about the event? Party. <laughs> Where is it being held? Um, it's at 114 Tilden Road. All right. Great. Seeing none, can I have a motion? Move to grant an outdoor entertainment permit to Peter Kelly Detweiler, 114 Tilden Road, for a fundraising event for the North and South River Watersheds Association with a band on 727-19 from 7 p.m. to 11 p.m. Second. Second by Mr. Harris. Further discussion? Seeing none, all in favor? Aye. 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 It's unanimous. Enjoy. We'd love to you see you there. Yes. Fun. You deserve uh, a party. Thanks. After all that.
If you don't need the answer, it's just bare feet. Um, the second one on the agenda is 92 Marion Road and 48 Oceanside. Peter Schreer. Hi, Peter. How are you? Good. How are you? Good. Uh, nowhere near as exciting as that. Don't <laughs> 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 um, sell yourself short. Last year, um, and I'm trying to have a party. I rented 92 Marion, which is like an eight-room house for my office in Springfield, bringing everybody up doing like an office retreat. And I thought on uh, Sunday afternoon or Sunday into the early evening, we were going to have a band, small band. I saw them play at. Um, place in Marshfield called Business Time, they're like four pieces. Um, and I know in the regs, you're supposed to get an entertainment permit if you can have music. I've mailed notices to the abutters, and I've also told people on the street, and you know, I don't foresee any issue. There's not going to be booze or anything like that um, that we're putting out, um, for sure. What kind of band? Uh, there's, uh, they play like 80s, 90s. Yeah. Um, Acoustic or amplified? Uh, I believe they have a piano, not a piano, like a keyboard, yeah. a guitar, and I'm sure there's a drummer. Yeah. I only saw them once. Right. Are there any abutters here? Good. Just how many people do you expect? Do you have any well, sense? There's plenty in my office, but my guess is, is people are going to hear music and <laughs> whatnot. Um, and so, whatnot. You know, if the, I don't know. I'm, I'm not anticipating it being a whole a big deal. But the band will um, be at one side, obviously. Yeah, the band. So the way this house is... So right now it's set up for 92. We could conceivably switch to 48 Oceanside, which is across the street, which is where we are. Um, and that I'm just sort of waiting to see. There's a He's got a grass field at 92, like a, a, a grass lot. Mm -hmm. And we talked about doing it there, and the band was going to be like on the other side of his fence on, on his property on, on 92. And I just got, I'm trying to see the logistics as to which works best. Okay. Um, but my gut is that's what it's going to be. And What's the street? Sean, you know that area. What? What, would you walk across what street to get to Ocean the two houses? Oceanside. Right across Oceanside. So. Yeah. <coughs> okay. Yeah. So, it, and again, we talked about doing it at Oceanside, but then there was a the question of the tide and where people could be, because we have an under, we have a porch under our house uh, with, um, uh, like, concrete, which we could do it there, but I'm worried with, it, with the tide and where people are going to stand and whatnot, so that's why I'm thinking 92 is probably a better location. Cool. Any questions? But it won't be both. It would be either or. Mm -hmm. Okay. Seeing none? Oh, well, just parking, just if they can get off the street, that's all. But the fire department, I'm sure, would increase. Correct. I know the people, so the people from my office that are coming, um, supposedly he's got parking for, for all those um, people. And plus my driveways have, I have a room in my driveway Great. as well. So I wouldn't anticipate that neighbors would be in the room driving up. That might be our intent. Have a motion? Move to grant an outdoor entertainment permit to Peter Shahir. Schreer. Schreer, Rose. sorry. 92 Marion Road for a private party with a band on September 1st, 2019 from 4 p.m. to 9 p.m. I have from 3 to 9. I I'm sorry, I'm sorry, yes. And 48. So, so let me just okay. add to that that it's also at 48 Oceanside and that the hours are going to be from 3 to 9. Okay. And I can tell you the band is only contracted for four hours. We're just look, waiting to see what the weather's like. That's what we're trying to leave ourselves some flexibility. But it will be, it's a four hours of music is, is what we're for. Right. Second it as amended. Second by Ms. Canfield. Further discussion? Seeing none, all in favor? Aye. 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 It's unanimous. Thank you. Have fun. Thank you. Um, the next one is uh, 106 and 114 Main Hill Road. I'm Sherry Rustleman. I live at um, 114 Man Hill, and this is the second time we've requested this. We had one last year. Our event is um, August 10th. It's from 4 to 10, and um, there is music in the afternoon. We have several different bands, and we share the yard with the Lagrateria's next door, and we have a bunch of people. We had a little pizza hut, um, truck in one yard. We actually raised funds. One of the band members um, in Three Saints in the Center um, lost his daughter to um, glioblastoma, and so this is the second year we've done a little bit of a fundraiser. And uh, so we have music, we have food, we have a couple grills going. We don't serve alcohol, but people can bring it. I'll be, you know, we did talk to Chris about it. Um, people park at the church. We ask permission over at the um, uh, um, St. Francis. Th yeah, St. Francis. Farmer. It's now a Coptic, I believe. St. George. Um, we go there, we've asked them permission. People park there and they walk over, bring lawn chairs. Um, 
I actually, we're going to have it on the 10th, but we do have a rain date of the 11th, so I don't know if that's something I can kind of get in there. I have a list mm -hmm. of abutters. Last year, you know, we notified everyone. I'm planning to do the same. I have it. Yeah, I just have it. I have a question. Great. Yes. Uh, do we need any type of, um, if they're having food trucks, do they need Board of Health certification it's for any of those? It's not property. It's not a public event. So they don't? Okay. We don't um, technically sell it either. We just sell Okay. I just want to double check. Okay. Great. Yeah. But they have to be licensed to sell it if it's a vendor, yeah. so. Which they are. Okay. That was my only question. It's a great event, and thank you for oh, doing thank that. You. Well, you're all welcome to come last year. Actually, if I We're going to be busy this weekend. <laughs> 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 this, is this is an honest space about a little bit. But you'll really You'll be there early, Jonas. Yeah. Yeah. Sherry, you said, the oh, you said the rain date would be the 11th? <laughs> the 11th. Do it that Sunday. So, so we yeah, move, yeah, move yeah, amend both. both. Yeah, more. Yeah. So are you, when you said, you said bands, so. So what we do is we set up, we have two little areas. That's why we use both yards. But we have, um three bands that come and play for about I don't know I think 40 minutes I wish my husband were here he, not even that long because we're only doing music for it. so say they do a half an hour and then in between when they're setting up we have um, young students and young people who you know aspire to sing or whatever and they come up and they play music so some is acoustic nice. some is plugged in some is acapella it kind right. of is a mix but it's nice, nice. yeah awesome any other motion. questions motion please Move to grant an outdoor entertainment permit to Richard and Sherry Wesselman on 114 Man Hill Road and Eileen and Greg Glagatoria on 106 Man Hill Road for August 10th from 2019 from 4 to 10 p.m. as well as a potential rain date on August 11th from 4 to 10 p.m. for outdoor live bands. Second. Second by Mr. Harris for the discussion. Seeing none, all in favor? Aye. 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 It is unanimous. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you, and we'll see you on the 10th and the 11th. <laughs> <laughs> I know. I should have said or. We need to update our official calendar. <laughs> okay, the next uh, item is uh, interviews for board and committee applicants. So we have two on our list today. One is uh, Robbie Burgess. Right here. Great, and Maureen Kelly will be next. Good evening. Thanks for coming in. Um, thanks for having me. And thanks for volunteering. Yes. Let me before you start. Let me just give. Well, we'll ask you questions and look at your resume. So we're going to be having interviews for the next probably three or four meetings. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of people that are interested now coming in. So we're not going to vote on it tonight, but we're going to hear you tonight. We're going to take our notes and then um, we'll let you know when the voting is going to actually happen. But okay. um, just so you know that it's yep. kind of casual. Sure. Good. So tell us about yourself and why you want to be involved on the zoning board. Yeah. Um, well, we moved, my family and I moved to town about a year ago, a little bit more than a year ago from Hull. Um, in Hull, I was on the zoning bylaw committee for, uh, I was appointed for a five-year term. Um, so started to understand how um, the zoning um, bylaws kind of worked, um, how the meetings were run, uh, got that experience, um, enjoyed it. Um, I do think it's important to give back to the community and the community government. I think that um, my skill set is such that uh, I'm not a plumber or an electrician. I can't do that. I, um, I'm a civil engineer. Um, so um, uh, design committee review or uh, zoning um, board of appeals is more appropriate for my, um, my skill set. So I enjoy it. I think it's important to contribute and give back to the community. Um, and I find it interesting too. I like the specificity of the zoning um, board of appeals, and I also like the um, the subjectivity of it too. Because a lot of times you're faced with special permit conditions that are outside of the zoning bylaws, and you have to use your judgment, your experience to kind of interpret and be able to make decisions, um, you know, that are somewhat outside of the the zoning bylaws at times. Um, you know, I've been a civil engineer for 20 years in Boston. Um, I'm licensed in most New England states. Um, I specialize in site development, transportation, parking, um, traffic, roadway design, site development. Um, I've been peer review consultant for the town of Pembroke in the past. Um, as a consultant, I've been on, at the stable for 
clients before, so um, you know I'm kind of familiar with with town government and. Um, being new to town, I, I don't have any biases. I don't really know that many people, so my neighbors you know, aren't going <laughs> to influence me. Hopefully, they're not watching. Um, you know, so I think that when I saw the opening, I thought that it would be worthwhile to apply, and you know, hopefully, the board, uh, you know, uh, considers me uh, appropriate for the position. Great. Questions? Well. I, I I'm interested in the zoning of uh, the, uh, the bylaw review committee in Hull. How active are they? Mm. It was, it was, it's a challenging committee in general to be on because um, unless the board of selectmen gives the committee a specific direction, they don't really have a function. Um, when I was on it, our direction was to review the zoning bylaws and make recommendations, which is pretty wide. Yeah scope of work here yeah. so uh, you know we kind of poured through the zoning bylaws and just tried to come up with ways that we could clarify the language and make it succinct and not make it too um, open to interpretation and, and that kind of thing so that is what uh, we did um, while I was on the zoning bylaw committee um, did you serve for five years no I did not um, I believe it was approximately two years and then because we didn't really have any direction people just stopped coming to the meetings and it just kind of petered out um, so you know it was kind of a disappointing finish but I think it was um, it was a worthwhile um, uh, endeavor because I, I learned my way around a bit and the building inspector was on the committee so we always had some good stories of how many members were there? I think there were five members. Okay. Um, <coughs> the, the building inspector um, and uh, three citizens and um, a representative from DPW, I believe. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Just um, I, have you had an opportunity to look at our zoning bylaws and get familiar with them? Yes, familiar I have looked at them. Um, I went through them. Um, they they are pretty comprehensive. Um, you know, I'm always interested in parking because um, a lot of times the zoning bylaws are adopted from other communities. So you know, the the planner will sometimes call up you know the town over and say, "What do you guys use for?" your dimensional requirements and right. you know so you can see some of these you know the parking requirements just you go from one town to the other and they're almost exactly the same mm -hmm. um, you know and being a consultant we've worked with um, Board of Appeals before to kind of have um, uh, be able to identify when certain zoning bylaws could maybe be um, modified or um, changed uh, mostly in terms of parking supply like um, for example a Home Depot if you go by the zoning bylaws you end up with you know 500 parking spaces for the first weekend in December and the rest of the year it's a parking lot empty of, uh, of cars so um, so I have looked over um, uh, situates okay. thanks I have just a comment, and I have to uh, share it with Tony. Um, very impressive background. You've uh, been involved with Mass Works grants and um, projects, as well as um, intersections and, and, and things like that around all these different areas. Um, thank you. I just appreciate that. Thank you very much for volunteering in. No problem meeting the schedule with your workload. I mean, um, you know, given that it's uh, the third Thursday each month, you can I can schedule Works. it. You know, so it makes it easy. It's just it's always the same time. So um, that isn't an issue. I already great spoke with my wife. Great, thank you very much. When when did you move to town? Um, May thirty first of last year. Oh, good. And do you do work in situ? Any projects? Um, we have not worked in Situate. Um, we've worked nearby in Cohasset and um, in a few other communities. Okay. Most of our work is uh, in the Worcester area, the Boston area, and Chelmsford. Those are where our offices are. Uh, one of the, this is one of the most important committees in town. Um, 
and um, the good thing about it is a lot of times there's an alternate. Mm -hmm. um, so a lot of people come in and there's the alternate for a period of time where they get to be involved and learn the, the ropes a little bit before they get thrown into the fire. Mm -hmm. So um, you know, that, that's usually a good learning process for people as well. So great. you definitely have a great resume. Did you have any? Yeah, no, I, there's not a lot to add. I mean, you have a terrific resume. It's really wonderful, I think, just being so new to town for you to step forward and utilize your skills, you know, exactly the, the type of volunteering that we really benefit from. So thank, thank you, you for stepping it. forward. And I love the fact that you're new in the unbiased perspective, <laughs> especially on the Zoning Board of Appeals, I think will be really helpful. You know, I think we always look for objectivity in those types of committees because it can be tough sometimes. No shade on the current members. <laughs> no, no, I'm just saying, you got to be objective. It's, it can, it's hard to be objective when you're dealing with neighbors sometimes, so mm -hmm. if you're not... Yeah. Now, you mentioned the design review committee. Is that another one you'd be interested in? Because there's going to be a lot of people applying. And it's, yeah, I mean, wherever I can be help, most helpful, um, you know, I think I... Uh, yeah, I think your skill set yeah. melds in there as well. So. Yeah, yeah but certainly. I've done a lot of design review. Um, I do quality control for the projects um, in our office. Um, I'm on the board of directors for the company. I manage nine people, so. Good. Well, thank you for coming in. Great. And uh, like I said, it could be up to a month or so before this gets figured out, but we'll let you know. No problem. And if Great. there's any other questions that come up, you can just email me. Um, I believe Lorraine has my yep. email. Yes. And, um, I'll be happy to answer them. Will do. Thanks, Thanks for right. coming Thank in. Thank you. Thanks for coming in. The is next full time position. Um, I usually the alternate moves up. Oh, okay. Um, the next one is Maureen um, Kelly. Hi. Hi. How are you? Hi. Nice to see you. Good. Thank you. Before we begin, I'd like to just explain my hat. Okay. <laughs> we were going to ask. It's odd. Um, so I uh, unexpectedly had some more extensive dermatological uh, surgery today. So I didn't think you wanted to look at it or you wanted to look at it. I don't even want to look at it. So hence the hat. It's a lovely hat. The hat looks great. <laughs> it's odd. <laughs> so you are applying for the uh, Council on Aging. I am. Great. So we have your resume. We've looked at it. Tell us a little bit about um, why you want to do it. So I have, um, I have the opposite um, uh, residency term. I've lived in Situate uh, for um, 42 years. Um, but my work, as you can tell from my resume, has um, centered around uh, Boston. Uh, need uh, my professional life mostly around Boston, Brockton, Chelsea. Um, and my volunteer life in Boston and uh, on a board uh, for a long time in Needham. Um, so this is my opportunity and this is my moment. Unlike all of you who have been so generous with your time over time, um, this is a, a moment when I'd really like to uh, get back to the town in some way and use my uh, skills, disposition to uh, be helpful. I thought this was a good match. Um, I was approached a couple of years ago to consider uh, serving on the um, Council of Aging Board, but I had too many other things going on to kind of put it aside. And then when I saw the opening in the paper, I thought, okay, I should, I should circle back to this. Um, so that's, that's one part of it. The other um, part is I think this is an amazing moment for the, for the Council on Aging and, um, and people, everyone has put in such effort in, and expertise and time over over more than a decade. Um, so I'm excited to uh, potentially be involved with all those hardworking people and bring a fresh vision and, um, and some expertise in development. Um, uh, this is the only population that I've never worked with is, um, is uh, boomers, as they're called in the uh, UMass report, and seniors. Of course, we all have anecdotal experience, but professionally, this is the only uh, um, population that I haven't worked with. So I'm interested to do that too. That would be my learning. Um, and I think my uh, leadership um, uh, skills, my communication skills, my work ethic, um, as you can see through my work history, I'd like to put to use for this effort. Great. Questions? Ms. Kerr? Yes. 
do you envision utilizing, so with your art degree, do you envision utilizing some of that experience in providing different types of programming for the seniors at the Senior Center? Have you thought about anything like that? No, you know, I, I, I don't. I don't envision that. They have some wonderful people who, who do, Joanne and other folks who do provide those kinds of services. <coughs> um, you know, it's uh, my experience uh, at Walker with the board is you just have to be, you have to be careful um, around your um, professional boundaries, being a board member and then being a service provider. <coughs> um, so it may be different when I um, uh, would be involved there. Um, if there was a need, I'd certainly be glad to um, jump in and fulfill that. But I'd much rather empower other people to do that kind of work, having done it for so many years myself. Gotcha. So obviously, you know that this, as you say, this is a big moment it for the Council on Aging. So in addition to just the, n the normal services and, and activities that uh, Council on Aging provides, um, we're going to be building a new center, so yep. there'll be a great deal of heavy lifting involved. Um, and you think your time right now, you could devote that. And there's also, I don't know if you're familiar with the um, age friendly, mm -hmm. what's, is that the right term? Friend, uh, I'm probably getting the term wrong, which is a more encompassing thing that the Council on Aging is helping work with those guys to um, um, make the community accessible for all ages. Right. Um, so all of those things are of interest to you, I assume? <laughs> They're all percolating. I mean, with Walker, um, I was the chair of the governance committee and then, uh, in addition, the vice chair of, um, of the board. And um, depending upon what was going on, it might be 20 hours a week. Um, and I was able to manage that with my work. Um, and now I'm retired. Um, so I, I don't see the time as a problem, and I don't have to drive to Needham. There you go. <laughs> That's right. Have you had a chance to attend any of the meetings yet or participate in the... I have not, no. Okay. no. I've looked at them online. Yeah, there are a great, as I'm sure the chair will mention, a great deal of interest in joining this committee right now for oh, the good. reasons you've mentioned. So it right. um, might be a good time to start attending and getting up to speed. <laughs> yeah, and I'll just follow up with that just by saying... Yeah. There are going to be a lot of people interested in this and Great. only so many slots. If there's a second committee that you might be interested in as well, I don't know if you put it on the list here. I did not. No. Okay. Yeah. So if there is something else, Great. you know, certainly send that along. I Any other questions? No, just an, another incredible resume. I mean, <laughs> it goes on and on and on. Very, Very impressive. Yeah. Thank you for volunteering. Thank you. Huh? Thank you all. Great. Well, thanks for coming in. I think you'd be a good fit, and we'll uh, see how like, it goes. It's a good time to be involved in it. Great. So. Thank you. Bye, bye. Thank you all. Great. So that's the last of the interviews. We'll be having more over the next uh, two or three meetings. Um, and a little prop for the four of you that are watching. Um, <laughs> there's a ton of openings and a lot of committees, so apply. The deadline was today. <laughs> um, let's see. The next item is. Uh, to, to, to the interview, so a discussion vote on simply serving request to add uh, to the catering list. Hi, how are you? Good, thank you. I'm Amory McCann. I'm from Simply Serving, to I'm the owner, and we provide event staffing, bartending staff, wait staff to private homes and functions and to caterers. We do all the staffing for Roach Brothers Catering, all their stores, um, Brothers Markets. Um, we do historical homes like the Endicott Estate and the Daniel Webster House in Marshfield and um, the Pierce House in Lincoln and numerous other places and basically it's staffing. We're fully insured with um, general liability, workman comp and liquor liability and we've been hired by Mrs. Barakis for a rehearsal dinner at the Situate Maritime Center on August 23rd and she's looking just for a beer and wine license for the evening from 4.30 to 8.30 so that she can have a nice little party for her guests. So. Okay. So are you looking for, is this two things you're looking to be put on the list as well as? Happy to be able to put, be put on the list. We do service the South Shore a lot. We have a lot of staff that live in the South Shore, um, you know, Pembroke, Plymouth, all over the area. And where are so you located? I'm not located in Norwood. You're in Norwood? Yes. Okay. Yes. So we have a great staff. I've owned the company for 24 years. I have people that have worked for me for close to 20. Great. So it's, it's a nice little niche business because we don't cook. Well, we don't cook. Um, <laughs> we'll heat, serve, you know, and, you know, get everything ready to, so that you get to enjoy your party. So if you were having 
one of these events that they were <laughs> looking to do, we could come in and set up, serve, and clean up so that they could actually enjoy their guests. And it's a nice little um, way to enjoy your guests so that you don't have to be stuck in the kitchen all evening. So. Okay. Questions? Are you Sean? Oh, I'm sorry. Are you familiar with the Maritime Center? Have you seen it? I have Facility? not been there myself. We have done three events previously, okay. um, but just for staffing and not bartending. So this is why we are there? here this evening. Yes. So you have to go. Yeah, all right. Yeah. As long as you're familiar with it. Yes. Campion? Actually, a question for Lorraine. Is there any cap to the number of uh, preferred vendors we can put on the list? There is no cap. Okay. How many do we know? Lorraine doesn't know this, but her company did my party. I, <laughs> I do know that, but I didn't want to throw you under the bus. Okay. <laughs> and how many, do we know how many are on the list at the moment? I just. There's probably, there's a couple that have dropped off and come on. There's probably about seven or eight right now. Okay. You okay. know, we've had some, you know, left, uh, she's also in demand. Um, so we love to have very respectable. I checked her references just today. Yeah. So uh, she comes with glowing references. Great. Thank you. Karen, any, any I questions? think the more the merrier. <laughs> We're happy to hear, be here. I mean, we do have a lot of staff on the South Shore, yeah. so it should be, be a problem. And all our bartenders are TIP certified. I require it. There's no question on that. Yep. So I noticed that. Yeah, the, the certificate's in here. Um, yes. Anyone in the audience have any questions? No? Great. So we have two motions here. Um, and Lorraine, how'd the party go? And you did. There you go. All right. Proof in the pudding. So we have two motions here. Yes. Move to approve simply serving two yes. LLC. Yes. yes. As a caterer for our recommended caterer list as provided on the Town of Situate website. Second. Second by Mr. Harris. Further discussion? Seeing none, all in favor? Aye. 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 It's unanimous. Move to approve a one-day wine and malt license for simply serving two at the Citrus Maritime Center on August 23rd, 2019 from 4.30 to 8.30 p.m. Correct. Second. Second by Ms. Canfield. Further discussion? Seeing none, all in favor? Aye. 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 It's unanimous. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for making the trip. Thanks. Yes. Thanks for the time. The next item on the agenda is a discussion vote for the special event application for Heritage Day. <laughs> and Linda and her binder. <laughs> Linda, you need a wagon. <laughs> but you never know what you guys are going to ask, so I want to have everything we need. So I have everything we need too. <laughs> um, so this is the 51st year that Situa Chamber has put on Heritage Days for the town. The Heritage Days Committee includes myself, Claudia Oliver from Wicked Local, Elaine Bongazon from Jack Conway Realty, Susan Fiore from Kitchen Spaces and Interiors, and Janet Bristol from uh, Frank Snow Inc. and Jean DiGiacomo Drea. And we're all thrilled this year with this year's event as we've added some more of what Situate's all about. Among the events that are coming are the Situate Fire Department with their hands-only CPR training and the Kids Fire Safe House, the Plymouth County Sheriff's Department and their safety tips and identification van. Uh, we're doing a Meet the Situate Police, well, I'm calling it that, I don't know what they're calling it. Um, <laughs> Meet the Situate Police, they're gonna have some of the safety service vehicles there for everybody to see. Um, NECN Weather Warriors coming, Mass Lobstermen, Situate Town Library, NOAA with Salt's 40-foot inflatable whale. Kids Rides will be back in an animal petting farm. Uh, we also have Irish Step Dancers, Situate Arts Association with Art Alley, uh, Bloom Twisting with Laurie, a magician, the New England Revolution Battalions coming with their mascot slide, uh, a pirate encampment, visits from Woody, Jesse, Jasmine, and Aladdin. Uh, we're having goat yoga this year uh, with the 4-H <laughs> Club and a free video game truck. There's also food and artisan and craft vendors, and this year we've added uh, 26, I think. Are we still counting? 26 new vendors um, coming this year. Oh, good. Uh, we also have the main stage with several bands, uh, two high school bands who hope to be household names in the near future, as well as local and national bands. The historic sites are open, um, and we kick it off with Friday night with the Luminaria and the Situate band playing. 
Um, as far as the details go, again, we're having uh, two buses transport people from Greenbush parking lot. Uh, we've spoken with the police and the DPW to go over some details um, and some changes for this year. We've asked for some more trash bins around the bandstand, and we're going to have a little bit better parking communication for uh, people who seem to park on uh, Front Street overnight. Um, I also want to uh, make sure that our, uh, all of our sponsors are um, uh, noticed. I'm not going to read them all off this year, um, but there'll be posters and, and stuff advertising who they are. Many of them have been uh, donating uh, year after year, um, and we also have some new ones, so I hope that everybody um, will support them um, and their businesses, because otherwise Heritage Days would not be possible. Uh, this year, uh, something new. Uh, we are hoping to add a waterfront beer and wine garden. We partnered with Untold Brewing and Reynolds Package Store. Um, Marty Block and his wife are here from Reynolds, um, who are both situate businesses and chamber members. The partnership will not only help provide much needed funds to help Heritage Days stay in the black, but also a new way for people to enjoy the many offerings of Heritage Days um, and what it has to offer, and um, especially, you know, also including the fact that Untold Brewing um, does a special beer called Heritage Days. Um, <laughs> So um, uh, Marty's here if you have any questions for that. Um, and then the final thing for us would be that um, we're again requesting that you waive the administrative fees uh, that is on these uh, bills that we get from the police, fire, and DPW. I'd love to have you waive their bills altogether, but I won't be greedy. <laughs> so um, do you guys have anything to add? Oh, you no, covered it all. Yeah. yeah. Linda, can you just explain um, the new the, the beer garden in that area? What, what sure. you're thinking, where it's going to be, and sure. So um, I had the. Uh pleasure of going to Norwell Summerfest this year uh, where uh, Marty and Matt had set up a beer garden there. It's a similar event. It's family friendly. Uh, they have bands and vendors and face painting and food and stuff like that. Um, and I watched it for a while and thought it was a great addition to the event. And so we approached them um, for a lot of reasons. One, the money. Two, the fact that um, they're, um, you know, fellow businesses in situ and we want everybody to uh, benefit. So. The uh, garden itself is going to be located, it's on the map, but it's going to be located in the back. Um, so the, the stage is facing the water, there's all the benches, and then in the back there. So it's kind of at the end of the food court. Um, so the kids' rides are way far away, um, but I don't anticipate any uh, issues. We had the uh, whiskey tent uh, for two years, um, and we had uh, zero problems. Um, in fact, the officer that was assigned to the tent was c quite bored. Um, so uh, we had no problems. And it did offer um, something for people to do who either have grown children or um, uh, no children or whatever. And they still came down and enjoyed the event. Um, uh, Marty and Matt went to great lengths to make sure that their tent at uh, the Norwell Summerfest was very uh, family friendly. They even had a character, you know, in there um, for adults who had brought their, you know, young children or whatever. Um, and so uh, we know, uh, I spoke with Sergeant Gil Martin, who's our um, liaison for Heritage Days, um, and just like we did for the whiskey tent, there'll be a, a police officer stationed there, or sheriff, one of the two, but uh, stationed there in case there's any problems. But like I said, that for those two years, there was zero, and I don't anticipate anything uh, with this at all either. So it'll be cordoned off by ropes or by mm -hmm. something? Yeah. I have a yeah. question. Did you, do you get a copy of the permit? Yeah. Mm -hmm. There's a map in there. I know. There's oh. people want I've, 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 <laughs> I've talked to Marty about it as well, so I know the answers to these no, questions. No, I didn't know if you knew. Um, I, I'm just yeah. want everybody else to, yeah. to kind of get that sense. Yeah. Um, Basically, the same rules that apply to the whiskey tent would apply to this tent. And uh, so they'll be carded each time they buy, purchase an alcoholic beverage. They also be uh, selling food and a non-alcoholic be beverages because you have to. But they're also at the foot of the uh, food court too, so there's plenty of food around them. Questions? No, I'm in favor of this. I think it's a good addition. I think all the things you're doing and you need to be financially solvent, and I know how difficult that is, so. More? Um, Question for Marty. 
Um, Thank you. Yes, <laughs> we'll make, make it worth your while for coming <laughs> out this evening. Um, do you plan on doing exactly what Linda saw in Norwell, or will there be any changes or adjustments? No, I think for the most part, it will almost mirror it. Um, we will have to just uh, to, to mirror what Linda was saying. We um, will have uh, beer, wine, um, canned spritzers type of thing. Not that we're not going to be, there won't be any open alcohol, meaning no, we're not making drinks or anything like that. So it's all going to be low percentage alcoholic drinks, no more than, than a beer, let's say. Um, and really a family friend, friend, friendly event um, where everything will be cordoned off. Uh, I can't exactly tell you how we're going to cordon it off yet until the space is actually, I, mean, I, I know what the space is, but I got to kind of visually see it, but we're going to, we're going to overstaff it. Uh, that's what, that was one of the biggest uh, pluses that we had in our last event that we had almost, <laughs> it seemed like we had more people working there than were actually in it. That's an exaggeration, but it was really important to us because to everybody's concern, one of the things that we have to watch is that make sure that beers and things aren't being passed outside of the of, of the actual space. Mm -hmm. And that is easily taken care of if you make sure that you have enough people uh, working there. And that's something that we're, um, uh, we'll have happen. And in the event of Norwell, uh, beer gardens these days, beer, beer gardens and music are almost like a, our, I don't want to say millennials right to pass it, because it's not, it's, it's all of our right, they pop up everywhere and it's, it really makes the event uh, just kind of a, a, just kind of a, a good feeling, you know, a good, and we were able to take this space and this is part of what I think the, the Norwell part of it was really uh, uh, refreshing was that we made it like Linda said, very family friendly. I mean, there, I, we, there were videos out there kind of went viral. We, we had Chester Cheetah there from the Frito-Lay guy, and, and we literally had people drinking craft beer, and we had five-year-old kids dancing with, with the Chester Cheetah all in the area. Now, we are we're going to be IDing, obviously, at the, the venue inside. My vision, first, we will do whatever it takes, but my vision is to allow families to come inside. We don't want parents to leave their five-year-olds or have to make that choice. We'd like to have their five-year-olds be able to come in. We envision having um, um, hay bales around the outside, which will help partition everything off, but will also act as seating so people will be able to sit and enjoy themselves and watch their kids. And, and um, But on the other end, it, people, underage people have to be accompanied by an adult. So. 18-year-olds will not be allowed to be in there. They will be asked to leave. You know? So you card at the point of entry or at the point of sale? We, we card at the point of sale. Okay. Unless you guys tell me other. We'll, we will obviously do whatever this board and, and, and the town wants us to do. But our vision is, is to ID at the point of sale. And then we'll have plenty of people around to make sure that that, that doesn't go anywhere. Mm. Uh, it's kind of no different than then they would do at Riva or at the galley, I and mean, everybody is allowed inside, and then what happens in there is is for the staff to to make sure is, is uh, obeying by the, the, the ABC and the town law. So okay. uh, that's our vision. Could I, could I? Okay. Uh, just a couple of questions on that. So the, the, the malt and wine liquor um, li um, one day license, is it to both? Untold and to Reynolds, or how is and whose liability and you know all of that? How so does that work? So the liquor license actually, because it's a Citro Chamber event, just like the whiskey tent, it, it actually is the chamber requesting the um, the malt and liquor license, um, and that um, we do have from both um, Untold and Marnie the um, certificates of liability insurance with the town and the chamber named okay. on them. So. Uh, I was just a little confused about the, yeah. you know, whose authority or responsibility. Yeah, yeah. Um, it was just like the whiskey tasting thing, and everybody's tip certified, and, and you know. Yeah, I, I, I think it's a great idea because, yeah. I, as you say, you can't walk 10 feet in Boston without seeing one of these pop up. It's, it's yeah. just really popular, and yeah. it is very family friendly. Uh, two outside questions? Just so Excuse me? The application yeah. yeah, that's. So, t so to Karen's point, just to follow up, the way the motion is written, when we get to that, it only names untold. 
So right. you probably need to also add Reynolds, correct? Yeah. I, I'd be more comfortable well, with that. Or I did that. Uh, I wrote it and I did not put Reynolds on there, but I will add it and we give it back. Because they're a liquor store and they don't serve the public alcohol like I'm told us. So oh, okay. They'll be uh, who will be checking the IDs, I guess, is the I question. It's untold. That's what I They'll have that. Well, we would both be. We're both doing we, it. We're we're both all, our, all of our people that will be the You're all trained as well as to. Okay. So it would be both of us. Um, and again, unless you tell us otherwise, we can do it. But our impression was is that we would equally um, handle it reliably. I can add okay. okay. if they okay. want it. Okay. Two more unrelated to the garden. Um, is there, has the sponsor deadline, is that still open? Will you still accept bags of money from people who want to? You will always <laughs> accept money. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I, mean, I just want to stress that to anybody that's listening is that um, there, it's, there's still time to contribute, and this is an asset to the community that has to be funded by the community or, or it won't survive. And I really want to know what a pirate encampment is. <laughs> that one I don't remember. There's, uh, oh, no, it's happened for a couple of years. It's great. Um, there's a bunch of pirates. And they're out by the bandstand, and they have sword fighting and swashbuckling, all kinds Excellent. of repair it. They, you know, it's the kids. Are, kids they're there for like, they've been there in the past for four hours. I think it might be six this year. Yeah, they just have a blast out there with they the have kids. They a parrot. I think. Yeah, okay. the what? They have a parrot. They yeah, yeah, the yeah. parrot. Yeah, yeah. A real one. Parrot. We no. love parrots. <laughs> yeah. um, oh, I'm sorry. One more question. What time does the music end? Because I'm looking at the hours of the beer garden. So the music, we hope, ends by 8 o'clock on, um, and we say hope, it, the last two years we've, we've ended properly on time and stuff, um, but it should end at 8 o'clock on Saturday and 7 on Sunday. Like, yeah, probably closer to 6.30 or 7 on Sunday. It just so the garden is time to, to it's coincide It's time to end that. basically when the music ends, yeah. Okay. And, and there is a little give in there so that they can, you know, you, you don't have to go, whoop, got to get out, you know what I mean? Like if there's, if we end a half hour early with the music, they still have time to finish their drink and get out, you know? Great. Sean? Um, I really probably have to make an effort to go. I have no idea what a beer garden is. <laughs> or just pirates on the I've never seen anything. Ask your kids. But, right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 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 Oh, then I'll definitely be there. I know what marigolds are. So my... my uh, comment is, you know, I go into Marty's about five times a day for my cokes, for <laughs> my co for my cokes, <laughs> for food, right? Yeah, uh, yes. donuts. So th that, and um, I mean, they've done a fantastic job. So whether it's Marty staff mm -hmm. or Untold, uh, you know, yeah. that we haven't had any yeah. problems. I, th I think you might have a good problem though. Yeah. Do you remember when Untold had that event? <laughs> yeah. So, just be prepared if you have to call in more help. All right. If everything aligns and the music's right, and and and, and that is great. I mean, yeah. un, do people in Norway realize? You know, what, uh, are they do they know about Untold? I know everyone in Situa does. Right. That's for sure. So, so I would say that that that's a, you are right right on point, Sean. You know, it it, it is um, it's a good problem to have. Right. But and, and when I, I actually I was approached by Linda first on this. And my immediately my immediate reaction was is that I wanted to bring untold in a launch. Mm -hmm. Part of the reason is that, but the other part of it is it was just the whole idea of having a green bush business alliance come down to the Situate Harbor area <coughs> and be part of this. I think was a good mix, you know. But it, to your point, Norwell, I, I think is secondary to untold. They they know it. We certainly do. We sell a. We sell a ton of untold in Norwell, a ton, but it flies in comparison to what we sell here. So it's going to be quite a draw, and um, I, I think it'll. Um, yeah, and you, to your point is, I'm going to be needing staffing at Reynolds for that day because everybody's going to be here. Well, be down there. <laughs> right. so that's, I think we should watch that place. Yeah. I'm only kidding, but Sean, <laughs> <laughs> so maybe you can work. Yeah. I'm on the other side. I think I missed it. Tony, I, I have you know, room for you too. Yeah. I got kids. <laughs> you all set? I'm all set. Thank you. Just Karen. Yeah, I just want to mention one thing. Um, I was at Cisco Brewery a couple of years ago. Yeah, and they put um, bracelets on people. And if you don't have a bracelet, you don't get served. Right. And it strikes me, and the reason they do it is because they've got so many like little barn areas, and right. if, if everyone had to keep presenting their idea, it would kind of slow things down. Right. It may be that maybe next year 
some sort of a bracelet thing could work for the whole harbor. Yeah. Uh, honestly, I, I don't remember. Well, we <laughs> they're on their own. Yeah. <laughs> Well, yeah, but I mean, they could even do it this year. I mean, that's yeah. not out of the question even now. I, I just got to think about whether that, because for the most part, I think it, it's, a, it's a quick hit for people. Yeah, yeah. I mean, for the most part, you know, the, the okay. bands play for like an hour, hour and 15 minutes. Mm -hmm. For the most part, yeah. that's what you got. Yeah. I, I would say that we're not going to see the same people. I would say you're going to, somebody's going to come in for, maybe somebody will stay for the hour. And then they'll have a couple of drinks, maybe, and then mm. that they're moving on. You, you know, we're not going to see okay. people sitting there, staying there for eight hours. You know, it just doesn't happen that way. You know, and yeah. um, and IDing is very easy for us. We we've got it all logistically set up, and it's it's easy. We you know we're doing so. It's, it moves quickly. Okay, um, and the uh, good. The, uh, he's right with the music. I mean, the idea with the music has been for the last couple years that. Um, we have a little bit of something different all day long, so you don't have those people that are sitting there for eight hours. Right. I mean, I hope everybody likes all the music we have, but you know, we have Irish, bluegrass, reggae, disco. You know, so we we the idea is get them in, have them listen, go shopping, go to the restaurants. You know, move along. So I, I you know, hopefully that's yeah. what happens. Sounds good. Yes, Miss Curry. <laughs> Why is it, Linda? Music. Do you have a headline band yet, or what are your what's your, what's your list look like? Uh, are you not? It, tomorrow we'll, we'll release the lineup. Yeah. Tomorrow we're still finalizing so hotel rooms. Yeah. <laughs> okay. But is. we will. But every yeah. yeah. And we have uh, two. Um, I think I told you two high school bands and yeah. Booty Vortex will be back because they got rained out last year and um, yeah. So it'll be good. I loved that you added the high school bands and local bands. Yeah. Sure there really we have one each morning. Uh, that was coming great. in, so yeah, yeah, so that's exciting for the kids. So. Yeah, it was great. Yeah. Well, we'll get to you guys in a minute. Um, so, can you tell us a little bit more about just the logistics of the event? Because we've already had one of you opening, one of you closed, and one of the streets closing. That's so, um, the street, Front Street, um, and Cole Parkway basically closed. Uh, um, there's parking. I remember, two two years ago, we changed the whole parking thing in Cole Parkway, which worked out well for me. I know it didn't for the rest of the town, but <laughs> for Heritage Days, it's great. Um, so there's a, se a section that we closed off Friday morning, um, and just Friday, so not on Tuesday for the stage and stuff like that. And then on Friday afternoon, there's another section that closes for the rides. Other than that, Cole Parkway and uh, the parking is open, and so it's Front Street on Saturday. Basically, there's no overnight parking in the areas that we need. So we're there at 5 in the morning, and Cole Parkway uh, gets shut down. Um, the, the Where it, CVS does the loading, uh, it gets shut down at 6 o'clock in the morning. You can still drive through the back. Um, Fun Street gets closed at 6 or 6.30 um, so that we can mark and set up the vending tags. Everybody has to be off Fun Street by 6 o'clock that night, Saturday night. So Front Street opens up. The back um, in Cole Parkway where the rides are and the vendors and stuff, that stays set up overnight, but you can still drive through and there's still a bunch of parking that is available for people. And then the same thing happens on Sunday, closes down at 6 in the morning and then reopens, Front Street reopens at 6 that night and Cole Parkway pretty much uh, reopened the whole thing because the vendors get out uh, by 7. So Good. And, and that's worked out great. gone overnight somehow, it just disappears. So. so you guys have done a great job. That's that's so much better than what we had to deal with a decade ago yeah um, and the traffic for the citizens is much better and, and the fact that there's always access to go around mm -hmm. um, if you want to is great yeah. I um, you know what one more thing so when Fun Street closes on Saturday uh, initially it closes from um, like vision source down we leave it open for Coastal Heritage and Rockland Trust because they have banking customers and then at noon time it moves out to close that area that so it is open for those customers great um, last year there was um, well, are, are there more booths you said there's 26 new no. vendors but it's the same number of booths yeah so there was a lot of uh, political vendors last year uh, so they're not coming back because they're not running. Um, although I do believe Patrick O'Connor is coming because he'd like to see the town. Um, but um, so we lost some vendors and had some attrition and some do one day instead of another. Um, but we have, um, you know, 26 new ones. Same number of booths, so it's 
won't be anymore. Okay. Yeah. Great. Um, one issue that popped up last year was um, the bathrooms, and especially with the beer uh, garden coming in. <laughs> Have you taken that into consideration? Uh, well. I mean, we, we can get more, but there's, we have two, how many do we get, 12? And one's handicap accessible. Half of them are on one side of the beer, uh, one side of the bandstand. The other half are on the other side, which is closer to the kids' rides. Um, and um, last year, um, I think it was, well, I, I don't know about last year, it was a year before, they got used on Friday night. Right. And so the problem was is they were a disaster Saturday morning. Um, so um, hopefully either they don't get used Friday night or, um, you know, we'll, we'll just have to pay to get them cleaned up Saturday morning before our people use them. But they got, they're all zip tied and locked. And um, our security, we have overnight security Friday night, uh, felt it was in his best interest to unlock them all because people were... Um, right. We'll no, talk your stuff in the right, so we'll line. talk to those people when they come in yeah as well yeah. Um, and make sure that they don't use but that those. was a problem but you know what you, you do have a good point we might want to add maybe two more for the for just the, think just, just think in the back on the yeah. side where the beer garden is uh, we have the security both nights too I know. Uh, we do have security yeah. both nights but Friday night was the problem um, with and the, and the hours of the beer garden are going to be Saturday from noon until Eight, eight and then noon until seven, seven on so yeah seven-ish okay um, great so just want to well first of all the beer garden um, I've seen it successful in a lot of places there couldn't be better people running it you know Marty has a business in town he lives in town he's got kids in town he's a family guy, um, and Matt as well that family invests <laughs> in the community as well so I think we're in really good hands in terms of running it um, the com the just the event itself people don't understand how much money and how much energy it goes into making this happen it, and these people do it most of these stores don't make any money on that day you know there's probably a handful of stores because um because they have to close for the event so we need the local support we need the people to to, to go and, and shop and and use the facilities and we need the people that are down there in the communities in town to donate to it it's as simple as that otherwise it just will go away and Linda, your group has done a great job to sustain it and to elevate it, and um, I think it gets better every year. So, and I think this will be a great addition to it. <coughs> well, the shops don't close. Let's not say that. No, they don't. But they don't. The well, don't take advantage. Do, do sidewalk sales. And well, a lot of them, things. especially the restaurants, they they do well. well they do yeah. really well. The restaurants are, are the other. Yeah. I think it's like the the financial services people don't open, but um, the chamber, you know, for three years. Uh, made an effort to reach out to those businesses and the hair salons and the nail salons and give them ideas of how they could make Heritage Days work right. for them and it's their choice whether they take them up on it but I mean I do believe that you know you got 20 30 40 thousand people at your doorstep you got to make that work whether you're marketing or, or, or something and, and it can be done but for some of them they choose not, not to and go and enjoy the event and so we're just right. as happy to have them do that so right great <laughs> Any questions from the board before I go to the audience? Mm -hmm. okay. The audience? I yes, ma'am. Just your, your name and address. Of of I just wanted to share um, the sustainable situated opinions feedback on the huge volume of single use plastics after the area. And we've tried to address that with the uh, waterways group in the past, especially the motors and transit areas that are there for fireworks and things. So, I'm just offering, not being this year because I'm very busy right now, but uh, in the future to work with the committee on maybe um, collapsible recycling receptacles and maybe get some community effort around gathering all the plastic that gets there. Because it's more than DPW can handle, I think, for the three days or two days. But, um, there's literally mountains of you know, plastic in regular trash receptacles, um, especially near the boats. Um, so I just thought I'd share that and offer some help in the future. Great. Any other questions or comments? Seeing none, we will move on. So we've got a couple no of motions. Mm -hmm. um, if someone wants to take a stab at it. <laughs> Um, move to approve a special event permit to the Chamber of Commerce for Heritage Days as follows. Friday, August 2nd. 
5 a.m. set up stage area, 5 p.m. set up amusement area of Cole Parkway. Are we taking these all together? Wait, that can't be right. Yeah, oh, five, um, 5 a.m., I'm sorry, for the stage area. Right. Um, Saturday, August 3rd, 5 a.m. to 7 p.m., Cole Parkway, and 5 a.m. to 6 p.m., Front Street. Sunday, August 4th, 5 a.m. to 7 p.m., Cole Parkway, and 5 a.m. to 6 p.m., Front Street. Second. Second by Mr. Harris for the discussion. Seeing none, all in favor? Aye. 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 It's unanimous. And? Move to waive the 10% administration fee for the 2019 Heritage Day special event. Second. Second by Ms. Curran for the discussion. So just, we waived it last year. There's certain events that happen in town that are really community-driven, uh, community and this is one of them, and I think it's a great idea to do it again, so. I'm in favor. Any further comments? Seeing none, all in favor? Aye. 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 It is unanimous. Okay. Moving on to... Uh, Are we going to use that motion as it's written? Um, where is it? Um, page 47. I think we have to add... I think so, too. You either add Reynolds packaging or you don't do either. You do both or neither. Why don't you put them both? I think both. Move the Board of Selectmen approve a one-day wine and malt license for Heritage Days to Untold Brewery and to Reynolds Package Store for Saturday, August 3rd, 2019 from 12 p.m. to 8 p.m. and Sunday, August 4th, 2019 from 12 p.m. to 7 p.m. Second. Second by Ms. Carmi. Further discussion? Seeing none, all in favor? Aye. 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 It's unanimous. Great. Great. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you guys. Send us the ban list first. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye. We're going to take you to the beer garden All with right. your marigolds. <laughs> <laughs> I get marigolds in front of my office now. Do you really? Yeah. Good for you. The next item is a discussion vote for Go Green Water Connection. Tim Lopes. I'm going to recuse myself. I'll be back in the next okay. agenda. Bye. Bring candy. Mr. Lopes, <laughs> thanks for Hi. coming in. Thank you for having me. Uh, my name is Tim Lopes. I own Go Green Landscape Spy, and I live at 10 Lincoln Avenue in Situate. I'm a Situate resident. Um, I'm here looking for um, an abatement for the water hookup fee. Um, just want to give you a little bit of context. So, when I won the bid to handle the town's green waste a little over a decade ago, um, I sat down with Al Banger to go over lo the logistical transition of taking the green waste from being collected at the transfer station, which is what the town did, to taking it and managing it over at Go Green. Part of that conversation involved water. So we talked about, okay, there's a big pile of green waste over at the transfer station. He said, Tim, can you manage that or can you take that? I said, I can. If it's ground up first, who pays for the grinding? Who pays for the, uh, the trucking? We worked that out. Um, what are you going to do for a building? He said, I have a hut. He delivered the hut over. What are you going to do for electrical and phone? Um, I said, I'll take care of that. I'll manage that. What do you want to do for water? And I said, at this point, I don't really think I need water. And that was the end of the conversation. We moved on to something else. There were probably a dozen or 15 sort of logistical transitional things that we talked about. In part of that conversation, my thought was, and perhaps it was incorrect, my thought was, okay, I don't need it right now, but if something changes in the future, I'll come back and I'll, we'll talk about it. And I, I didn't think it would be a big deal. Fast forward to now, um, over the past six or seven years, the need for water has increased um, as a result of a manufacturing process that we use to make mulch. And I've had sort of a temporary water solution that doesn't really work um, doesn't really work well for the town. So <laughs> the time has come for a permanent uh, water solution where I have access to water um, at all times and I can control the water. The question is, because I'm, I'm a renter, I don't own the land, <clears throat> my lease um, expires in 10 years, Do, it's the town's property, I maintain that I shouldn't have to pay for the um, the was a fourteen or fifteen thousand dollar connection fee, and I, I'm I will. Pay
pay for all of the connectivity around that, but the actual connection fee, I think that that should be the town's responsibility. I don't know of another situation where there's a renter that doesn't have water. Um, so that's kind of why, why I'm here. Um, in retrospect, I probably should have told Al <laughs> I'd like to have water. But at the time, it was, we had a really collegial relationship, and things came up in the first two or three years where um, you know, if he had a need for something, I was happy to do it. And if I had a need for something, he was happy to do it. I probably should have at that point said, you know what, uh, can I have water? And he would have said, sure, no problem, go ahead. But here we are now, um, and it's a bigger need for me. It's something that I have to have, and I'm hoping that the town understands that and is willing to continue with what I think is a, is a partnership. I think that Go Green provides services for the people of the town that greatly, um, that are far larger than the town could provide in that regard. We're open more hours, we're open more days, um, and we pay a lot of money in rent. And um, hopefully we can, it's something that, that we can work out tonight. Great. The only thing I'll add is um, when this was beginning to be discussed, I think maybe last year, or maybe the year before, where Tim always had a temporary service. It was a temporary hookup instead of a, a real hookup. Um, the hookup fee was $6,500 at, at one point. And now we just raised it recently to fourteen thousand. So there's there's kind of that in the mix too. Um, but he is looking for a full abatement, um, and he needs the water, like he says, uh, for his mulching to make the mulch. Really and I paid for the water. I mean, last year I paid almost five thousand dollars for water. So right. I paid for the water. The water's not free. And he has. You're paying for the usage. Yeah. Correct. Right. You right there. Yeah. <laughs> Questions from the board? I have a pile, but... Why don't you do a couple? Start? <laughs> All right. Um, so, this is... So, obviously, your service is very much needed and desired by the town and, and, and does create, you know, um, you know, a place for, I think, a, you know, almost everybody comes to see you at some point. Mm -hmm. So, that's very much needed. Um, issue. Um, what's complicating this for me is looking at all the backup is the long-term um, lease, what the terms of the lease say, what services were provided, as you pointed out, that it's, you know, we don't want to be um, unreasonable because it is a great service. Um, but I would act. I, I would like to see some input from town council about what the terms, what we are required. Have we, in, um, under the terms <coughs> of the lease, it does have utilities are your responsibility. Um, and then the other point of that is, you know, if we were renting a space, I mean, it is rental space. This is compli. I mean, this is it, it is a conundrum because we had rented you an office space, mm -hmm. and you would want us to build out three offices at the beginning. We should, would have said sure, and that would have been reflected in the rent that you paid. If we were bringing water service to the site, it maybe it would have reflected in your rent. I don't know. It was it was a bid. It was a bid situation. It was a bid situation. So I, I bid what I would pay. Yeah. Right. So it's different. We're not regard. we're not paying to put the water service in. Mr. Loves would pay to put it in. Right. This it's is just, just the, the connection fee. fee, and he's asking for us to waive the connection right. fee, but he will still be responsible for bringing that water connection to the property. And has council opined at all about just sort of the landlord le lessee? It's not in the lease that we are uh, required to provide it. Um, yeah. If we provide a utility, he has to pay for it, is what it says. Okay. So if we provide water, he's going to pay for the water, but it doesn't say in the lease. I went through it. I didn't even have council look at it. It doesn't say anything in the lease that the lease includes bing, 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 bing. Doesn't say okay. includes water, but as we said, his operation now requires the use of water. Uh, it gets right. way too dusty, way too evolution. dirty. So there has to be some sort of water. Then he had a temporary connection. Uh, the water department does not want to do any more temporary connections. They want a permanent connection to that site. One other comment before I you know, pass the mic is, um, and it's not. It isn't really related to this conversation, and I and I understand that. But um, I I'm not really familiar with your. Um, operation. I've sat in this chair for almost 
two years, there are two things that people come and stop me on the street and they're concerned about. One is prime water, which we talked about already today, <coughs> and the other is concern with um, safety and access and um, customer service at your site, at your business, which I know you're well aware of. Um, so that to me, I mean, if we're going to be talking about the terms of the lease, I want to make sure that we're in compliance with all of the terms as well. Um, I know it's a separate conversation, but I really feel like I need to mention it because honestly, I can't go grocery shopping without somebody mentioning because everyone uses the service because it's a needed and necessary service. So I just mm -hmm. really want to make that point. And then I will. Um, right. So I'll step in for a minute because I've, I've spoken with Tim about this and we are working now. There's a hit list of six or seven things that are in the works that I think probably within the next couple of weeks we'll be moving towards impacting those. So would you think it's fair to say within probably by the end of July people will see different things going on at the Yeah. Yeah. Can you yep. can you share what those six or seven things are? I'll run off a few of them. Um, so traffic flow, the height of the pile, um, there's some it's a little bit too close to a lot of treatment plant in the back. Um, some of it is just the sweeping process and the parking. Um, I think those were most of the things. Jim, did I? Yeah, most those are most of the things. Hours? And yeah, oh, and the hours, yep. Uh, the hours of the, the uh, operation, too. Not, not so much extending the hours, but just being aware that people come at the last minute and seeing if there's a way to better serve them. So I know Tim's working on that as well. Is that what you meant? Those, yeah, those are the things. Uh, no, that but the, the hours part. Oh, it, it, it was a combination of all those issues. Is, but, I mean, it, yeah. it depends on what people, it bothers, whatever, you know, whatever that particular person thought was a problem, that's what they talked to me about. Oh, understood. So. I just, you mentioned hours, and I wasn't sure what you meant by Oh, that, I meant so. the late, yeah, people queuing up. So I would remind everybody watching, <coughs> don't wait till the last minute and then be mad when they close the gates. So <laughs> it's, it's a, a combination of It's a user. challenge, I think, at every business. Yeah. You know, if people are, if there's a queue, which we are working hard to alleviate and we generally don't have except in, in the leaf season um <laughs> we'll, if there's a queue we don't close the gate but if you get there at 335 and we're just waiting for someone to leave you don't I mean if we let i've been there if we let you in while we wait for that other person to leave and you take five minutes someone else is going to come we won't get home until five so it's a little bit of a challenge yeah. right. well, we're, okay. you're going to we're working on yep. some sort of because there's nothing worse than loading your car <laughs> full of leaves and branches and stuff and then going home and unloading your car full of leaves and branches and stuff um, to go to work the next day. I think we all agree with that. Um, yeah, more. Um, so, Mr. Lopes, why was it that last year when the temporary water service um, was provided under a condition? for you to install a permanent one within six weeks. Why were you unable to meet that request? I worked with someone that was going to do it for me, and he didn't do it. Yeah. And then my second question is, are, and this may be more for Jim or Nancy, or, and I'm, I'm just drawing a blank right now if there, this exists anywhere else. I mean, do we rent, lease out, uh, property to anybody else in town where uh, they pay for water connection fees? They were paid for water connection fee? Not that I'm aware of. Do you have a rental? <laughs> the lighthouse is rented, the uh, house is rented. Residents. Apartments that already have a water service. Right, so there was no connection fee charged to them at that, plus that's probably a gazillion years ago. But the we've been in the rent. We would have set the rent based on. Right. Okay. Yeah, everybody else has existing service, so. Right. Yeah. Right. It's a unique situation. Yeah. <laughs> Karen? So the Board of Selectmen sets the water connection fee. Correct. So the Board of Selectmen has the right to either waive it or reduce it. Yes. So I'd like to think that, you know, given the fact that you were prepared to ask for water service a year ago or did, and for whatever reason it didn't get done, we have since raised the rates significantly. And since this is kind of a one-off situation, um, I think we ought to consider it. 
Um, but I too am concerned about the size of those piles, <laughs> and I don't know if you have to have a, no pun intended, a yard sale, <laughs> and start to get rid of it because it's just it's becoming a real eyesore. And as much as you know, I appreciate what you do. It's it's kind of tough looking at it. So, just my two cents on that. <coughs> And, and the dirt that it causes onto the road that it's not immediately taken care of. I think it's gotten better this past spring, honestly, but. So a couple things with the, in those regards. Yeah. The, um, you, you can't see it because of the way that we manage the, we manage the yard logistically this spring, but the large pile that you see, we, we basically have, have th three different piles. We have the brush pile. We have what's called a once ground pile, so we've ground it once. That's the large pile that you see. And then we grind it again, and that's the finished material. The once ground pile, believe it or not, is half the size of what it was. But we've worked from the back towards the front, right. so that we don't we're not in people's way when they're dumping. Ha so half of that pile is gone, and we still have a significant portion of the season to go through, um, where more of it will go. Um, the material leaves in tractor trailers on a daily basis, um, so we are trucking out thousands of yards of material each week. So material is leaving. And to Tony's point that he said earlier, the change that you're going to see, I met with, um, with Deputy, uh, Deputy Chief Thompson and went over a new traffic flow plan that we're going to be implementing. Um, we just have to grind through the brush pile in order to make it, to, in order to, to execute on the plan. But a significant portion of that large pile is, has gone. The large pile is a direct result of the winter we had two years ago, and we're bringing in significantly less material now than we ever have because we dramatically raised our prices to the contractors, which hurt us financially, but it was the right thing to do relative to the space restrictions that we have. Okay. Um, I, I understand the concept because my husband does composting, so we've got all these, but he's back in the woods. Mm -hmm. um, so I know what you're doing, but I guess my concern is is that I don't recall that pile ever being as high as it's been in the past couple of years, and I guess you know what you're saying, but it would then strike me that maybe there's an off-site place that you could bring some of the stuff or sell it to retailers like the, the people over in uh, Route uh, 139 that have piles or Frank's not Frank Snow, Frank, Wait, whatever he's in Cohasset, yeah. Um, because again, you know, I know we need to do this, but it, it's such a scenic area, and you know, if, if they weren't so high, mm -hmm. I don't think anyone would be so bothered, so. Just my opinion. No, they're, they're all, <coughs> all good points. Um, I've, I've probably dealt with this more than anyone. I've read the leads. I've been working with Tim over the last month or a couple months to figure out what's going on. Here, the lease is 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 very <coughs> unclear in terms of mm -hmm. the responsibility of who's supposed to pay for this, who's not supposed to pay for this, um, and um, I don't think it was intentionally done that way. I just think that's it wasn't thought of, um, and um, I think they're two separate things. I think the water right. is one thing, and the the site planning and the site work is another thing, and and. Um, so although we kind of want to combine them because we don't talk to you very much and come in and <laughs> talk about it, I think we kind of have to separate them in our brains and um, and know that you're going to be doing stuff. I'm waiting. Oh, I thought you were <laughs> shaking that stick at me. <laughs> no, I'm just um, that, uh, And know that you're working on this other stuff and it's going to get done pretty timely. Um, in terms of the payment for this, the more I think about it, the less I think that... Um, that he's responsible for paying for it. I think that it's it's not something he's going to take away when he leaves. Um, I think it's going to be an asset to the property at some point. It's the town's property, and I think that um, he's a renter there paying rent. Um, initially, I thought the same way you did, Karen, that we would have sent the rent different, but it's it didn't. He bid on the property, and and you know, although it didn't say it included water, and we could probably justify that he should pay for it just in the whole yeah you can I mean you can read it that way um, but I think him being a renter and paying us eighty thousand dollars a year he's entitled to water and he's gonna pay to get the plumbing aspect of it done it's just not a hookup fee for the town 
um, and I think the town really would be paying itself because it's the town's property. So I agree with uh, with Karen in terms of that there's an abatement that Both should be us. done. <laughs> yeah. Oh, <coughs> squared. Most recently, um, and um, and I think we just have to discuss whether. I mean, I don't think there should probably should be any. The more I think about it, um, and uh, that's my thoughts on the on the water aspect of it and the other stuff. We just got to work and, and make make things happen on the site that people can see right away, so that they have a better feeling about you know the aspects of the business as opposed to the surface that they provide. Maura. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, so that's one of my concerns, right? If this is really, I was, it was my, I was going like this, okay? Relax. <laughs> so it says right here that the lessee shall at its own expense make all repairs, alterations, additions, and or replacements to the leased premises which are required by federal, mass, um, federal Massachusetts or town of situate law or by law or regulation as a result of the lessee's use of the leased premises. So, I mean, I'm not a lawyer, but for me, that paragraph sort of states that when he initially bid on the business, right, and you didn't need water back then, so, be, but you changed your operation and a new technology to require water, right? To, to I still right. needed water, but it, again, in part of the conversation with Al, it was something that we kind of tabled because it would, it would have been nice to have water, but I really didn't think that it was something that, um, you know, we're moving fast and trying to take care of a whole bunch of things. Right. I still, you can always, you always need water. But now I absolutely, but now you absolutely positively need, need water. It. It's required in order for you to operate your business. So, um, the other thing too that I'll point out is, it, again, I view this as a partnership. I, I and that's, that's my point. So let me. So I'm right there with you. <laughs> I view this as a partnership, and I think that this is a little bit of leverage for us to see those improvements that need to be made on your site. Um, so, and I'm not saying that I don't, it is a conundrum with regards to the connection fee um, in, in that issue. I, I, I agree with that perspective, but I'd like to also instill upon you our really um, strong desire to have the way in which the operation runs improved. And you've got those steps from meeting with Tony and, and Jim and, and folks. So um, for me, it's a little bit of leverage, right? I, I'd like to see a little bit of improvement before I can personally just say, yes, let's abate it. And that, that's probably where I will come down on this. Um, I, but I can't make material disappear without water. <laughs> oh, I get that. So I can't do what you're asking no, me but to you do. Have water you have water today. Water. It's not like you don't have water today. I have a short-term solution for water. Mr. Chair, if you have You done? Mm-hmm. Ms. Camper? Well, thank you, sir. <laughs> Um, I do appreciate you coming in here and having this conversation because I know um, I agree with Tony that these are separate issues and having this conversation has really helped me think it through. Um, I, I think that you already have water. The town's requiring you to upgrade it. It's going to be at his cost, which uh, to do the, you know, the upgrades, mm -hmm. which I think addresses the terms of the lease. And we own the property as the town. You don't own the property. So I am um, becoming convinced that that's connection fee is not your responsibility. Um, because I think the, the passage that you just outlined, if you're going to upgrade it as required by the town so that you have permanent service at your expense, I think that meets the requirements of the, I'm convinced. I'm not a lawyer, but I think it meets the terms. Um, you know, you've heard us loud and clear about the other aspects, which are not really what we're concerning. Um, and what one thing we haven't talked about: what would be the timing um, of doing getting the new, the permanent solution? As soon as a contractor will do it. So it's. Is an is an engineer? Like I don't know if we need no, engineering or. We have to have an approved an approved contractor to do it. Okay. We've listed contractors. That and you'll do the work, we won't do the work. Correct. Okay. All right. Well, I'm going to suggest that 
if we were to waive the fee completely, that a solution on your part to get some of that huge pile trucked out to another site might make me willing to consider it. Um, that's just I understand opinion. completely. <laughs> we, we, we truck it out every single day, and that pile is half the size that it was. And if you, oh, I, I would invite all of you to come down, and I will show you the giant open space that is behind it. If and that can't be moved to that giant. Op it can't be reduced. Spread out. Spread out so that it's not. It can be, but it's several days work with machines. I mean, do, do you want to do that, or do you want me to turn it into something that I can get rid of permanently? It's I can either move it, spreading it out, get rid of it permanently. And one of the other things we're trying to do down there, which is open up more space for cars to get in and out. So you spread the pile out. The height of the pile, just so you know, is regulated by the fire department. By that's the fire department. That's a mass fire statute. They get on and they check and make sure that the height of the pile does not exceed what is required in the uh, code of mass regulation. So. They keep an eye on, he has to keep logs, heat logs, height logs, things like that. So when they think it's getting too high, Al actually goes down, he takes a transit, checks the pile, it's too high, he knocks on Tim's door and says, get the pile down below where it's supposed to be. Within how much time? Before some... Within a couple of days. Yeah, I mean, Al's, Al's pretty good about it. Yeah. So one thing that we talked about with Tim was actually closing for a period of time so that he can get the site looking the way that he wants to do it. Um, I haven't. We haven't met since we we kind of brainstormed on this stuff. So I'm sure we're going to get together shortly and go over the plans that you've come up with. Um, but that may be something too, where it closes for a couple days to the public, so we can go and get his machinery moving stuff or getting stuff out, as opposed to dealing with pushing piles where they have to go. So um, there's been good discussions. It just isn't being visualized yet, and I think that's what the board's saying is they want to. Yeah, I mean, a, a, couple, a couple of comments. First of all, um, I'm a Situate resident. My children go to Situate schools. My wife's the adjustment counselor at, at Situate High School. We're very invested in, in this community. It is no fun for me to, um, to get hammered in social media. It is no fun for me to get, uh, have conversations like this. I'm not intentionally making things difficult for anybody. We got absolutely blasted unexpectedly by the winter two years ago and it has taken us time to get caught up in April May and June and in this year part of July because the spring was so late we do two-thirds of our business so for us to try to um, move piles or manage other things we're manufacturing the product on a daily basis machines are running six days a week just to keep up with demand we're almost through that and then we can really address the issues but in that 120 days roughly it's it's like Christmas for us I mean, we have to we have to just make and make and make and make and make my goal and if you go back and read the initial newspaper articles when this first agreement was struck was to make this to be something that the town is proud of I understand that it's not right now I get it we're doing the best that we can we are we have over a million dollars in equipment that we are moving material on a daily basis and like I said if you want to come down and see it I'm happy to show it to you tractor trailers come in and remove material from that site every single day and to your point we do truck it we put it in tractor trailers and we ship it to Carver so material is moving and that pile is half of what it was you just can't see it because of the way things are laid out right now right but our intention over the next three to four weeks is to is to grind the entire brush pile which will open things up and then we're going to alter where we manufacture things so it won't be behind stuff and it'll be more wide open. You'll be able to see us manufacturing it, but it'll be far away from you where you're safe. But it everything will be more wide open rather than everything towards the front. That's kind of a nutshell of what it is. So there is a plan. Why don't I suggest, or see what you guys think about this. Why doesn't Tim come back with a plan and a timeline that says, okay. by August 31st, the pile's going to be down, the road's going to be different, the um, times or whatever the what, what are the five or six, seven things on the list are going to be, and you actually be able to see them, yeah. and then we can actually vote on the payment. Yeah. Does that sound more to me? What you guys want to do? Does that sound fair to you? Is that me? Whatever you got. We just have to talk with the water department. That, that are you getting? 
Are you getting the sufficient amount of water from the temporary hookup now? Yes. So you're not going to get any more flow from a... Okay. No. So water's not going to impede you from doing your business. Doing your... Right. Okay. One, one other suggestion, Mr. Mm -hmm. Chair. Um, if you were to have the same hours as the dump, the transfer station, <laughs> people don't go to the transfer station and expect them to be open after 3.30 or whatever. I think I have, it's 3.30. I have greater hours than the transfer station. But I'm just saying to you that if you didn't, if, if your hours were the same as the transfer station, people would say, they all i got to get there. By the they, they are. They're, they're more. He's open. The transfer station closes two days, and he doesn't. Um, and the transfer station closes at 3.30 on weekdays. We're open until 5. The issue is primarily on Saturdays and Sundays at 3.30. When the transfer station is... Uh, is closed. Yeah. Well, the transfer station has the exact same hours as we do. I right. don't know what the transfer station does if people arrive at 3.32. My guess is they go home. <laughs> we're being encouraged in. to not. Right. So. <laughs> yes, you are. Yes, we are. That's, that's a conundrum yeah. for us. Right. And maybe the transfer station should, too, because the second worst thing is loading your car for <laughs> a <laughs> that's not the and car. getting in there and have the gate closed. Well, so. except for the fact that know the at our house, you know what it is. You know what it is. Hours hours know. Know. It's been published. I mean, they're right there at the gate. Right. Well, but it still happens. I don't yeah. know. Yeah, it's such a it. <laughs> Okay. All right. So, Jim, are you fine with that? Any feedback from you? Oh, good. All right. So, at this point in time, Tim, why don't you and I will set a time to get together with Jim and Kevin and Mark Thompson, get a whole plan laid out with dates and stuff, get it in front of everybody, and then once that timeline is met, we'll meet, reconvene again and talk about the abatement. All right. Thank you for coming in. <laughs> thank you, guys. Appreciate it. All right. Thank, thank you. you. Okay. Moving right along <laughs> to um, an update Our and read and discuss the online community choice aggregation program. Lisa Bartola, and I saw the Scanlon as well. You want to come up? Okay. Uh, no. I have John O'Rourke here from Good Energy, who is our. Um, Thank you for waiting. Sure, thanks. For the Community Choice Aggregation Program. Thank you. He has one Thank you. brief handout. If permissible. So, thank you for having us. I'm Lisa Bertola, 52 Elm Street, situate, chair of the Community Choice Aggregation uh, Committee for the town of Situate. And I just wanted to give a brief intro um, about where we are with this, and then I'll hand it over to the expert, John O'Rourke from Good Energy. Um, since we, uh, November 14th, 2018, when two articles were passed, Article 13 and 14, um, we got the green light to move forward as a committee and assembled as a committee. Uh, we have a great group of uh, energy experts on our committee, as well as residents and um, environmental grassroots folks, myself included. So we have really good balanced discussions. We've had three or four meetings since inception, and uh, I can't say enough about how well constructed our committee is. We really have expertise inside uh, experts from municipal, other municipal um, committees and just a good conversation about what what our goals are and um, making sure that this keeps in mind everything that those two articles set out to do. And just briefly recapping what those two were, one was to um, give the green light to explore community choice aggregation, which is permitted under the mass general laws. Um, the details of how that's done are all defined in the law. I'm sure John will allude to some of those uh, provisions. And the second article was a non-binding resolution that the town passed at special town meeting to increase the percentage or the amount of renewable energy uh, credits or RECs in our energy source, um, but also be sensitive to price and what the current basic service rate is at the time and make sure that it was affordable for residents. Um, Included in the legislation is also a provision that residents have choice. So that's also something we feel strongly as a committee about making sure folks have choice. Um, so we've had three productive meetings. We've done a lot of research on our own, looking at other cities and towns that have done this and what the climate is. And we've had John and his team uh, appear at two of the meetings. 
We've had people from um, green communities, uh, the green side of the equation, show up and inform us on what the state of affairs are in Massachusetts for RECs and the likelihood that we can do this. Um, so I think it, we've had a lot, I can't summarize everything we've done up until now quickly, but suffice to say, we have the shell of a program. I think you received copies um, at, after our June 26th meeting. Um, this is just a shell, and I think John will um, speak to that. It is the sum of our conversations, and it, it, is, it is flexible. I think provisions of it will get determined and finalized when we, when Good Energy advises us on a good time to go out to bid as a town. Um, and I just wanted to add before John takes over that our meetings were so informative, productive, whatever, that we actually had uh, two uh, other town uh, groups that were looking at this come in and listen to some of our proceedings to, to learn and to um, brainstorm on their own and they are in their respective um, journeys to, to explore this and it could, it's only a potential possibility but um, at the time we go out to bid if they were ready and able our purchasing power could grow even more on that day if they were ready and able to join in on just the purchasing not the design of the program every town would have their own program but um, it was kind of nice kudos, I think, to John and to our committee that uh, would spark interest locally on, on going through with this. There didn't really seem to be a downside. So I'm going to turn it over to John to describe the shell of, mm -hmm. of our program and um, the specifics and answer any questions. Thank you, Lisa. Uh, Mr. Chairman, members of the board, Mr. Town Administrator, uh, thank you for letting me appear before you tonight. Uh, I have a brief, uh, let me start out by also thanking the, uh, the Situate um, Community Choice Aggregation Committee for choosing Good Energy to be your aggregation consultant. Uh, we plan on, on putting together a very successful program for Situate. Uh, let me just go over this very briefly uh, to give you an idea of, of where we are. Uh, one of the one of the tenets of the program, which uh, Lisa and the and the committee was very concerned about, was the amount of green energy in the program. Uh, we have drafted other plans uh, for communities that have wanted an additional amount of green energy, uh, and we came up with a a ratio in the plan that the committee decided on as a starting point. Uh, the plan is very flexible throughout. Uh, it, it's um, uh, development we have a draft that you've seen uh, let me just go over some of the key points here uh, other uh, MAPC communities that we've dealt with uh, Arlington Avon Bedford Brookline Hamilton Gloucester Rockland Somerville Stoneham Sudbury and Winchester all of them have chosen a green plan uh, which essentially means that they're uh, standard or default product of the plan has uh, some additional green energy uh, in the mix uh, of uh, generation. Uh, key points of the plan, it's universal access. There's an initial period uh, where residents are informed about the plan. They have a 30-day period to uh, participate, decide to participate or not. Uh, that's a, a, a period that's decided under the law. Uh, our plans basically are that people can come in and out anytime they want throughout the plan without penalty or termination fee. Um, the committee has chosen at this point a standard uh, product that has 10% more green energy. And as I say, that's the plan as it is now. Uh, that can be changed any time, including up to the day of the bid. Depending upon what the market is at the time of the day of the bid, uh, that can go up or it can go down. Again, depending upon what uh, Situate wants to do uh, with the plan. Uh, there are three choices in the plan. There's that standard choice, and again, 
for the for the sake of the draft it's 10 percent more at this point there's also basic which means that's the same amount of green energy that everybody gets in Massachusetts which in 2019 is 14 percent no matter where you get your energy from uh, whether it's national grid or Eversource uh, all of your electricity has to be has to have 14 percent from renewable sources uh, that's under the uh, uh, the renewable portfolio standard for the Commonwealth uh, recently uh, that has been going up at 1% a year but legislation just changed that to 2% a year so in 2020 that will go from 14% to 16% uh, on that on that basic level there are also for those people who are very concerned uh, about the environment, about <coughs> ecology, uh, climate change, they can choose to go to 100% renewable energy in their part of the plan. Uh, and certainly um, uh, participants in the plan uh, throughout the term of the, of the supply contract can bounce between those if they want. They can go down to the 10% up to the, to the 100% depending upon what they want to do at the time. Um, John, before you get to the timeline, just a sure. quick math question. When it says 10% extra local renewable energy, is that 10% of the 14? So does it go to 15.4 or does it go to 24%? That goes to 24%. That's additional, 10% additional. If I could speak to that uh, default design too, we had a lot of conversation about what was the right number. John assured us we don't actually have to pick the number right now. It's going to de depend a lot on what's going on in the market the, at the point in time where we go out to bid. We understand as a committee that the goal is to be competitive with basic service rates at the point in time we go out to bid. So. I think John actually gave us some feedback that 10% right now looks like it could match basic service rates if you had a favorable climate for going out to bid. So it seemed like a reasonable uh, place to start. We've had um, a number of recent bids where the towns originally had in their last go around 5%. They bumped it up to 10% this time because of uh, the renewable certificate uh, renewable energy certificate market it allowed them to do that and still stay under um, the basic service rate of the utility uh, if I could just walk you through this timeline uh, of the of the aggregation steps uh, you pass your article uh, the um, services agreement is with Jim he can give that to me whenever he gets around to it we've developed uh, a draft plan and again that draft plan um, goes through a number of iterations uh, as we go through uh, the approval process and the consultation process um, essentially uh, we're at the point now where this plan could go to the Department of Energy Resources uh, for their consultation uh, that's the first requirement in the law uh, after you've passed your article at town meeting and you've developed the plan, the next, the next step is to go to the Department of Energy Resources and essentially they do what's known as a consultation. Their attorneys go over the plan, they make sure it's in compliance with the law. Um, that has become almost pro forma uh, these days because there are 150 communities in the Commonwealth that have an approved plan. So the documents have been perfected, uh, probably 98, 99%. So what uh, the Department of Energy, Re Energy Resources does, they go through the plan. Uh, there used to be a lengthy uh, conference uh, that we used to have go, go to, uh, to uh, uh, Boston for, sit there two or three hours with their attorneys and make sure everything was in compliance. That has turned into about a 10 or 15 a um, minute conference call uh, where DOER basically goes over the plan uh, very briefly and basically says it's in compliance and they issue a consultation letter. That consultation letter is the permission 
uh, for uh, the town to uh, submit the plan to the Department of Public Utilities. Um, and essentially, while the plan is with um, DOER, that's about a six to eight week period, okay? During that period and um, coincident with that period, you can do a public review. And essentially what that is, is that you offer um, uh, your residents the opportunity to look at the plan, uh, to comment on it, um, uh, to make any suggestions for changes, okay? Of the uh, 46 or so plans that we've done, we've only had one situation where a resident made a suggestion where the language was actually changed and a clarification was made in the plan. Most of the comments uh, are favorable comments that we get. Um, mostly they, they, they uh, compliment the board on going forward with a project like this. Uh, there are questions that we get, uh, some of which might can be concerned about why is it an opt-out rather than an opt-in program. That's a popular one. And again, all of the comments that are, that are done during the review period, and it's required to be two weeks, could be longer if you want. Uh, but essentially, it usually starts with a, um, a board of selectmen meeting where you announce the start of the public review. Uh, and it usually ends with a board of selectmen meeting where there is a public hearing for anybody who wants to make oral comments at the end of the review period. During that review period, um, any comments, any written comments that are submitted become part of the plan to be submitted to the Department of Public Utilities. The department wants to see any comments that residents have had, so that becomes part of the plan. Um, after that letter is given uh, to the town from the Department of Energy Resources, um, it goes to the Department of Public Utilities. At this point in time, that process is taking six to eight months. Hmm. Um, it should take a lot less, but unfortunately, um, municipal aggregation dockets do not have a statutory deadline. And a lot of the other dockets that the DPU is uh, involved in do have statutory deadlines. So what happens is if they're busy with other dockets, the municipal aggregation plans dockets get to the lower end of the pile. That's why, why it takes that long. Um, what they will do uh, after they're finished reviewing the plan, they will have a public hearing. Uh, normally what happens is that the public hearing is that, uh, that myself or one of my colleagues is there, our attorney is there, usually a representative from the town is there. Um, they have a hearing. Um, the utilities has a rep there. The DOER has a rep there. Everybody makes comments. Lately, those have lasted less than a half hour because, again, uh, much of the work is done uh, through, through paperwork rather than through, through hearings. Uh, after that public hearing, what sometimes happens is they will ask for clarifications of language or they will ask questions about the plan, uh, normally clarification issues. Um, again, that's, that's normally not a, uh, uh, an excessive uh, amount of time. Uh, once they issue an order that the plan has been approved, and again, you're talking about a, a period of somewhere between probably eight or 10 months before that happens. Uh, once that's done, uh, then we do an RFP to uh, competitive suppliers. Uh, normally we have three or four competitive suppliers bidding on the load of a municipality. And essentially they will give you a bid ranging anywhere from 12 to 36 months. Uh, and essentially we put together a matrix on bid day, 12, 18, 24, 30, 36 months. Sometimes we'll do odd months, maybe 27 months, 28 months, depending upon how the market is, to make sure we can get a bid that conforms to uh, something that is lower than the basic service, okay? On bid day, the town picks the bid that they think is most favorable to the town. Obviously, we give you recommendations, but the final decision is yours. The town can go out to bid either on its own or with other municipalities. 
as Lisa mentioned, um, two other municipalities have um, <coughs> expressed an interest in perhaps joining with Situate to go out to bid. And again, throughout the whole uh, aggregation process, each town is independent of the other. They all have their own autonomy. And what they can do on bid day is come together as a group if they wish. Mm -hmm. If they don't, they don't have to, okay? Uh, it is advantageous. Uh, our largest aggregation in uh, Massachusetts has 23 communities, uh, all bidding at one time, all putting a bid together at the same time. So that's, you know, obviously that's advantageous to join together. Mm -hmm. uh, not only do we have the, the, the two communities uh, that are neighbors of yours that are interested, but we're talking to another three communities in this area as well. So it could very well be that if everybody finishes this approval process reasonably close, you could all go out to bid together. But again, <coughs> all the towns maintain their autonomy through the entire process. They can go out to bid together if they want. Um, once the bid is, is um, signed, uh, then customer notification letters go out to the residents. Um, that's a process that's about six weeks. There's a 30-day opt-out period. That's the period uh, prescribed in the law. However, in our plans, people can go in and out whenever they want without penalty of termination fee. Once that 30-day initial period is up, uh, then uh, accounts are rolled over on the next meter read for anybody, anybody who wants to participate. Uh, and again, as we get closer to bid day, we start to ramp up marketing and information, public sessions, uh, whatever the town wants to do in terms of that, uh, press releases. We usually do a, uh, an interview with um, the local TV station so that the residents uh, will know what's happening. Uh, and as I say, that gets more and more intense as we get closer to the bid day. And during that uh, opt-out period, it's very intense. Uh, we do a lot of public meetings during those periods uh, so that people can come and ask questions uh, and make comments. Okay, so that's, that's the whole thing. So basically, you know, you're, you're probably 11 to 12 months away from actually starting the plan, implementing the plan itself. Uh, as I say, the initial stage right now is the draft plan uh, and the public review. Uh, it can go out to um, uh, the Department of Energy Resources uh, within the next couple of weeks. So we have a document that has some dates for public review. Is that a finalized date? Are they? No, that's, that's you know, as I say, you can, you can do that two-week public review concurrent with um, the time it's at DOER. So there's no pressure on you doing it like in the next two weeks. Okay, that but can the, be done in the next couple of months. But the, the comments are part of the submission to the DOER. Well, not to the DOER, but to the DPU. They don't have to okay. be in the part to the DOER. They do have to be in the, in the plan that goes to the DPU. Right. So there was a suggested to oh, to Sorry, right. Michelle, Siegezi, and myself took a look at all of this prior to the meeting to see how we could possibly implement it. And we took it upon ourselves to put together uh, an aggregation program, a program timeline and review for mm -hmm. your consideration. You don't have to do this. Uh, we did draft a uh, hearing notice. We have we have also have a a script for you and a suggested timeline that you can you can use if you want. Is your timeline similar to this? Um, the timeline again suggests a two week public review period. Yep. You can you can fit that in any way you want. Some towns um, want a longer period. You can do that too if you want. But again the DPU requirement is two weeks. Most uh, most towns go with that two week requirement. <coughs> you will find um, 
that even though you have a public review period, um, you very rarely get more than a couple of comments or a couple of questions. That's been our experience. Great. So this other part is going to happen regardless. We could, we could literally do it in December if we wanted to because it's, it, doesn't, it doesn't have any bearing on the report that's going to the DOER that's going to take six to eight months to get through anyways. Well, DOE, six to eight weeks. Yeah, six oh, to eight weeks, eight I'm weeks. sorry. Yeah. yeah, weeks. The month weeks. one is with yes. the DP. Okay, yeah. so we don't have that much. No, you have right. two months. Right. Yeah, call, call it a two-month period right. that you need a, a, a two-week period. And are you end. ready for that to go to the DOER now? This could go to the DOER tomorrow. It could. Okay. okay. The only thing we need is the um, to go to the DOR is the uh, the services agreement which Jim has that he's going to going to give to us when he has a chance. <laughs> they require they require that that is in the plan. And it has to go through the public comment period. It what? It has to go through the public comment period also before it goes to DOR. Before no. or no. simultaneously? No. Sorry, wrong. Just DPU. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> it has to go, it has to okay, go through the public, public review period before DPU. Mm -hmm. But DOER doesn't require that because that's so just a that consultation. You, you can do it concurrently. Okay. Yes. Okay. Yeah. That's what I was missing. And ju just so people, folks know, I, John, the good energy is um, the, the entity that would take care of the PR in terms we, of. We do, we do everything. The only thing you do is decision making. We do all the heavy lifting. Right. Karen? Okay. Um, Thank you for coming and explaining this. this is such great progress. Um, I would feel more comfortable. Um, I, I like the proposed timeline that Lorraine's put out. I think if your experience is that it's not an issue that actually gets a lot of input as far as the common period, I see no reason why we wouldn't launch it right away anyway. I, I would rather not submit that document until the review period is over if we're going to do it by August 6th, only because... You, you, can, you can do that, that's fine. I, th yeah. I think it's a little disingenuous to ask for comments, and even though it could be incorporated later at the first... I mean, that's just sort of my feeling, is I'd rather have people have the opportunity, and then once that's finished, then release that document. I'm, if you can advise me that that's not such a good plan, I'd listen to it, because you guys it, do this it, all day. Some towns choose to do it that way. Yeah. Some don't because they realize that there isn't going to be too many public comments because most of this, yeah. most of this is legalese. Right. And it's a, it's a very good document to read if you're having trouble sleeping. Okay. Otherwise, most people won't understand most of what's in here. That's why you don't get too many comments. Um. I just, I, something you said, the, the 30 day, the different, I thought the original plan was we were going to have one option that you could opt in or out. And did I misunderstand that at the end of the whole process, if everything goes well, that there'll be tiered choices? There are, there are, getting, there there are will three, be three choices. The most, okay. the most popular plan we've been working with is those three choices for those communities that want a green aggregation. The, the standard or the default is one that has either five or ten percent yep. additional green energy mm -hmm. and then you have you give people a choice because <coughs> it, it, it's politically savvy okay to make sure that you don't have residents coming to you saying oh well, I don't want it I don't want green energy you can't make me buy green energy so they can go down to the basic, basic. which is the same amount that they would have to get whether no matter where they go or you have the 100% option for those people who want to go full green. Okay, so there are and three choices. And when you choices. bid, you bid all three of those options then? Oh, absolutely. Sure. Okay. Yeah. All right, that was different than the time meeting. I, I thought mm -hmm. it was we were going to come up with a plan A or a plan or you would just go get us somewhere else. Well, you can still do that. Those you can. Those three options yeah. are, are it. You either say no thank you, and you can go to another third right. party and get your energy. Or you have the default, which you it'll be a seamless switch. People who don't opt out get switched into the default. So it's an extra f ten percent, hopefully. Um, or you can have the crazies like me that'll go one hundred percent. Thank you. So if Sorry. someone doesn't choose one of those three options, where are they? Where do they fit they in? One, two, out. or three? At one. No, no. All right, at one. So default. there's nothing. The default. Right. default. The default. The, the, the ones. That everybody goes into if 
they don't make another choice. That's Automatically the default, that's that. the standard. That's but okay. we, can, we can change that if we want. We can make the default whatever one we want, right? Yes, you can. And did I hear you say that that's m most mirrors what we they have now? The yeah, most just. popular plans that we have seen, that we have done for communities that are interested in more green energy. Well, no, no I mean like what they presently have. What, right? we, what we presently have right now. That's what you presently closest. have right now. It would be, it would be the basic, the basic option, basic. which is equal to, it's an apples and apples comparison mm -hmm. to what the utility is providing in terms of, of green energy, which is 14% right. in 2019. Okay. All right. I might have asked this question before. Would this have any effect to residents that currently can get rebates on updating their heating equipment? Lisa, you might have answered this for me before, but it was so and long ago. Third party contracts are grandfathered, right? There's no interference with any existing like uh, the, or the, the, only, the only residents who are eligible to be in the plan are those on the basic service uh, with the utility, okay, with, with National Grid. I don't know if that answers my question. Well, if, okay. if you currently have an aggregator. If you currently have an aggregator, you're, you're not, not going to get default. a customer notification letter for this plan. Uh, what normally happens is that as people learn um, there are, this plan is available, and they look at their bill and they realize they're paying a rate that's too high, they can, again, if the, uh, their contract, they can get out of their contract and there's no termination fee, they can come into the plan if they want. Uh, what Sean's question I think yeah, was, if, right. as a National Grid customer now, I am eligible for rebates and certain money back for upgrading my Heating. furnace, my heat. Yeah, that doesn't has, change. Has, has has no, that has won't no change. Effect, has no effect on any of those programs. Has no effect on any discount programs that people are on. Okay. They continue. They will continue in those programs. Okay. All right. Hmm. Those are supplied by the. Transmission. Oh, the transmission. Right. 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 Not the not the source. Right. Cool. Karen. Yeah, I'd like to. I think this is a little aggressive in terms of public understanding, and I would think that an article in the Mariner and an article similar on the town website about what we are currently considering, including stupid questions like, well, if I if if the power goes out, who do I call? With okay, you know, everything I mean, still remains with the utility. Well, you, you know and, that. I don't know that. And, and the public in general doesn't know that. And I think if we go ahead and we put this plan into the regulator's hands up at the State House, and we, we're going to get people calling saying, what the heck is going on? Because we have people who go in and find documents and read them all, all the fine print. And then there'll be a hue and a cry about what is going on. So I think simple a simple language q a about what we approved at town meeting what it might mean for you why we think this is potentially a good thing to do i think to do that up front rather than waiting to the point where we've we put it out to bid. uh we will do a press release that can be put out okay like right now right now yeah that, that basically outlines what's happening uh we also have uh we've reserved uh, a website for Situate, Situate CCA, okay? Um, I'm going to have our marketing uh, team talk with Lisa. We'll put up a website now, okay, that, that we, will, we will control that will basically have frequently asked questions. It will have a, not a lot of information but some introductory information right now. Uh, and essentially, that will you know start to guide people. You don't want to get too far ahead of yourself because you're talking about a long period of time mm -hmm. here. Yeah. And if you give people too much information too soon in the process, they forget it by the time you get down to the real meat of the information. Well, in which case you just keep repeating it. Right. <laughs> you know, I mean, seriously, yeah. people usually sure. have to hear something three or four times Absolutely. before it sinks in. Right. Yes. And, and just, just remember, we went through the education and the outreach mm -hmm. once already mm -hmm. to get the articles passed. People don't learn, don't retain, to your point. Right. And I'm not optimistic that they ever will, especially when it comes to an electric bill. Um, but that said, that's the role of the broker, and that's what he's paid for. A good energy is going to be paid ultimately through the kilowatt hours for doing all that outreach. 
On page 8 of 16 in the document, there's a list of I all have to apologize. Items. I don't think I saw that. Oh, okay. And the only reason why I don't think I did is because uh, when I got elected, no, I got handed a... Too much. Yeah. So yeah. if it's in that, if it was in that pile, I still it's haven't read it through it. I have to say, so the brokers the have office. extensive no, amounts of outreach. It's, just it's like boilerplate okay. language. Yes. They have FAQs. They don't have all of that you... It won't even be invented for, the, for our purpose. Right. It's... They're... they're a well-oiled machine when it comes to the outreach. We're, we're, we're the national leader in municipal aggregation. We deal in every state that has aggregation. We're the leader here in Massachusetts. So we've done this many times before, and we have a really good way of, of putting it out. The, the, right now, again, um, we'll put out a, a press release, an initial press release to let people know. We'll put, you can put something on your website. Including what? aggregation means I mean I'm talking sure. real simple oh, basic oh absolutely oh absolutely yes yes consumer friendly language very much so you know about what it means and who will be your supplier and again right. who do I call when the when I don't have power right when the lights go out. Who do I, who do I call when the lights go out? <laughs> it's the it's transfer station. The only yeah. So yeah. I call yeah. National yeah. Grid? Yeah. The only thing that changes is where the electricity supply comes from. National Grid continues to service the account to bill. Everything else stays the same. Still get a bill from National Grid. The only thing that changes on the bill is the name of the supplier and the price. Okay. Everything else stays the same. But what Karen's oh, saying, you've heard this before. What she's saying is not new to you. Oh, no, not at all. So, I mean, she does, you know, I mean, I feel exactly what oh, you're saying. Oh, absolutely. So. Oh, yes. at town meeting, when special town meeting happened, I'm convinced <laughs> three quarters of the room. No. Still didn't right. grasp what it was. Right. Well, things that's happen at town meeting, meeting and it's it. the end of the night or yeah. the middle of things, and we're trying to do so much. But, you know, I, like I, I said, I don't think talks. many people are ever going to care enough or know enough about how their electric bill and how this works. But well, as I, a committee, but we, I think the board um, felt comfortable enough, and the committee certainly feels a very big responsibility to make sure that ratepayers are not hurt with this program. Correct. Ratepayers will not be hurt. They should, at the end, they should actually thank the town and thank the committee for going, using our purchasing power to lower rates. That they will have a menu of choice. And though the majority of residents who care about the environment and the amount of expenses the town has related to storm damage due to rising sea levels, climate change, we're doing our part. So we're meeting all those objectives with this program design for mm -hmm. sure. More? Um, so I think one, I, and I was, I've always been behind this initiative, but I wanted one of our, I think, things that came up in discussion before I went to town meeting was to make sure that the committee was a balanced committee and, and we had two, two sides looking at this initiative. So I'd like to understand from the rest of the committee sort of, um, you know, was the vote to put this plan unanimous? Was there some, was there another perspective? I'm just curious as to what the total committee's the evaluation was. Just say your name and address. Oh, sorry, Lisa Scanlon. Um, it was it was very unanimous. The actually the only opposition was our chairperson who wanted it to go higher. So it actually went down. Hmm. So was <laughs> that voted? I'm up. So it, yeah, it definitely was. And it was very much the gentleman here, um, a major uh, representation there, and, and incredible. And they definitely always keep us. Uh, really caring about the, the rest of the town and the rest of the, the community. Well, well, I'll get to you guys in a second. Yeah. Well, that was my question. Was oh, you want oh, okay. Yeah, so I think he's actually <laughs> raising the answers part of the committee as well. Go ahead. My name is Jerry Kelly. I'm a 56 Blue Man Road, a younger member of the committee. <laughs> uh, I was not as convinced as others that this was something that we should pursue. Uh, I thought it was something that was worthy of discussion. Um, there is no guarantee that the rates are going to be low. You're going out with a one, two, or three year contract, and during that period, you may be lower, you may be higher. 
renewable energy rates and costs have gone down. And if they continue to go down, your rates will be lower than what the base case is. We're using a lot of big words here, aggregation, defaults. Basically what you've got, and Mr. Chapman is far more expert than I am at this, you've got an electric supplier that will be the wholesaler, and you've got an electric distribution, which is, you know, Mass Electric for Hummer Rock, and then store for the rest of the town. Um, that's the distribution. They're responsible for the poles. You know, if there's a disruption, you go to them. Don't use terms like aggregation of the fault. You've got a baseline energy, which in our case is going to be 24% renewable. If you do nothing, that's what you're going to get. Well, that's not completely accurate. We can decide what, what the default is going to be. I'm saying, yeah. per this example. Right, right exactly. Right. Yeah. Right. Per this example, the state, uh, the state minimum plus 10% is what's being recommended by right. the community. It's your decision. Right. But that's what you're going to get. Don't talk about aggregating or defaults or anything else. That's going to be your, uh, your electric solution. Yeah, I'm going to stop you for one second because we all get it. We yeah. we get how it works, and you know, I I think Karen's point is everybody else may not get it, so we've got to explain it to them. We've got to dive into the the things that we may not think of, like like you said, who are they going to call and all that sort of stuff. Um, so. Um, yeah. And I think that's important. I think that was the other Karen's, Karen one's, uh, Karen one's <laughs> thank well. and thank you. Um, yeah, but I, I think when Mr. Chapman was trying to answer your question, he spent his, in this, his life in the utility industry, and he was a member of the committee. Yeah, no, you, it's a great committee. I know Scott's <laughs> done a lot of great things in the industry as well, so. Um, and Jamie's not here. He also provided great insight. Jamie. Jamie doesn't know Okay, great. So this is what we this is what we asked you guys to do, and this is where we're going, and we're going to bring it before the town. And I think uh, you know the Karens just want to make sure that everybody understands it at the lowest level, so that they can pick pick wisely. Um, the whole thing's going to be in the numbers, right? I mean, whatever you can get on the day, if we can get a hundred percent renewable energy at the price that people are paying now then everybody's going to pick that, I would hope. You know, I don't think anyone Thanks likes so well. to, to <laughs> non, not use renewable energy. Um, I have a, a couple of questions. Um, uh, Jerry just mentioned the term. So when we buy this block of energy, is it typically, you said 28 months, is that a two or three year term? And is it a fixed rate? You, you, will, have, you will have a choice. Uh, we'll get bids at 12, 18, 24, 30, 30 months, 36 months. Locked in. Locked in, fixed rate okay. for the term. And what do you, your experience in this shows that the best rates are at the two to three year? I mean, we don't want to do this every 12 our, months. No, our, our, our recent aggregations, uh, our, our municipalities have picked anywhere from 24 to 36 months. That's the sweet spot right now. Okay. Next year, it may be different. But right now, that's the sweet spot. Right. And I think also to, to to Jerry's point, the people are going to get it. It is it's not it's not that complicated. Everybody gets an electric bill. Everybody sees there's two sections to it. One of them is getting the energy, and the one of them is getting it to your house. So um, I think we can explain it to them, and they'll be able to make. This is essentially a bulk buying program. Right. right. That's what this is. Right. Um, the service agreement. So we're we're signing an agreement to go into an arrangement, a business arrangement with you, but you are paid through the rate on the energy that we buy. 
Right. The, the town doesn't pay us anything. Right. It's so you get a it's a very it's a very user, user friendly services agreement. You can get out of it any time if you want. Okay. Uh, but it's a requirement to submit the plan. Right. But again, the payment to you comes from the rate, a portion of the rate that we That's get correct. Okay. Yes. Right. Great. So I think I agree um, with a couple of the opinions here that although we want to rush, we want to go as quickly as possible to make it take effect, mm -hmm. we, we want to do it so that people feel like they're being listened to and that they're educated on the process. So. I think one of the dates in here was right away. My first thought was to do it after the summer when people are kind of settled, but that's going to push the calendar out a little bit too far maybe. But I think we should think, think about whatever time period we want so that we can get the marketing out and we can get the, the word out to people. And, and like Lisa said, they've forgotten about this, right? Nobody even knows what this is. So we got to re-educate, re, -educate, re, -re you know, remember, let people remember what's going on, um, and then tell them what we're doing. But whatever, whatever schedule is comfortable for you is fine. The only thing, comment I would make is, again, the submission of this uh, outline, which to DOER, doesn't. We don't have to do public outreach before that moves forward. Correct? Do you agree? We don't have that? to. But Karen had a good point. You're kind of belittling the opinion, maybe, to somebody if they think the plan's already in. But the, but the final approval is doesn't DPU. matter for this one. It does matter for DPU, which is six, eight, or eight weeks later. But no, we understand that. But her her comment, I think, was the perception of stuff like there's, you know, someone may want to look at that. And like you said, there was a change made to it once because somebody found something that that they didn't like, and to to have those things happen and then say, well, it's already there, is well. is a thought to it. Yeah, to consider. and DPU looks at the consultation letter received by DOER, which is based is, in Yeah, so I, I, I agree I'm with not you uncomfortable with a, a, a summer timeline, because I really don't, I think, I think it does, and you, is the website ready to go? Like, are, are the outreach, some of the outreach tools ready to go? That could be ready in a week, and again, I'll, I'll get our marketing people in touch with Lisa, and we'll, we'll talk about what she wants. Why don't I propose that you get the marketing stuff together, and why don't two of us get together mm -hmm. before our next meeting and come up with a plan, a timeline of it? Do you two mind? Yeah, no, it's fine. Thank so you. why don't you two get I together, to. and you know, <laughs> Lorraine, what's that? K2, K squared. Oh yeah. We'll just blame um, and, each other. <laughs> maybe Lorraine as well, and she and Michelle kind of have the, the skeleton of a yeah. plan together and come back next meeting and give us. Yeah, I don't think a, a long delay, but I think yeah, it would make it it would be better just to relaunch the conversation before we submit to the authorities. Sean? Is there a more favorable time of the year to go out summer, fall, winter? <coughs> Normally we go out in the fall, uh, but we've had a number of plans uh, that we went out uh, in July because we, we had a situation recently where the natural gas 12-month strip has been down at a very low point and that's what what basically dictates your electricity prices going forward so it's been a very good time to bid in the last month or so we have a bid coming up uh, next week uh, we're still in a very good period but normally we try to do it in in the fall period September October so we're 10 months away yeah Wait, who knows? Yeah. yeah or we don't even know if there's Right. If there's not a lot of stuff at the DPU, yeah, whatever, whatever, whatever you're comfortable with is fine. Right, and it's also not going to, we're not having much control of when it gets right. approved. Okay, I think we've got a plan in place. Okay. Um, any other comments from anyone in the audience? Lisa? No? Good. Well, great job, guys. This is exactly the first step that we need to have done, and um, it seems like we're right on track. Your, your plan did a great job. Great, great we did. Very comprehensive. But I, I, I would say the takeaway is for you to get the marketing stuff ready to go because yeah. next week we'll be ready with a timeline. So we'll be back two weeks. Yeah. We, we, so do it all, we do it all the time, so we're used to doing it. So. Okay. Great. Thank you. Have a good night. Thank you. Have a great evening. Thanks for staying late. <laughs> the um, next uh, topic is. Uh, 
855 discussion <laughs> vote on um, disclosures of municipal employees. This is basically employees that work in two different roles. Yep. And just have to be Teach, disclosed. Teachers and coaches, something like yep. that. Yep. Yeah. Teachers yeah. that coach. The first people that work uh, in rec program. Dispatchers who want to work as special police officers. That's the first one you have. Yeah. Okay. That's the first one? Oh, okay. There's two, right? Oh, I see it. Yep. And the so first one are police officers. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Move that the Board of Selectmen, as required by Mass General Law, Chapter 268A, have reviewed the disclosure form from municipal employers Aaron Lamonti and Brian Roday to provide services to the Citrus Police Department as special officers and that such exemption is approved for municipal employees Aaron Lamonti and Brian Roday. Second. Second by Mr. Harris for the discussion. Seeing none, all in favor? Aye. 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 Second one is a library employee that uh, wishes to also work as a, an election worker. Election worker. Mm -hmm. yeah. Move that the Board of Selectmen, as required by Mass General Law Chapter 268A, have reviewed the disclosure form from municipal employee Susan Frankel to provide services to the town clerk's office as an election worker, and that such exemption is approved for municipal employee Susan Frankel. Second. Second by Mr. Harris. Further discussion? Seeing none, all in favor? Aye. 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 It is unanimous. Great. Moving on to the next item. Um, we are going to discuss the annual ambulance abatement. Nancy Holt, Town Finance and Accounting Director, Accountant and Finance Director. Whatever you call me, I'll answer to it. <laughs> <One answer. laughs> um, I don't know if I should be afraid that you put your glasses on. That just makes me a little bit more nervous. No, I, could, I couldn't read it. <laughs> <laughs> um, so it's an hour behind, so his eyes are tired. I, I understand <laughs> that. Um, Annually, we look at our ambulance receivable and bring it before the board to see um, if they want to abate any of the ambulance receivable. The current uh, adopted board policy is to abate after 24 months, uh, but the actual application of that has been more along the lines of leaving um, five years open, 60 months open, and anything older than that to be abated. So I gave you a summary in your packet. Uh, of what's outstanding from fiscal year 2014, so be bills beginning July 1st of 2013 all the way through the current. Um, and what I'm uh, asking for the board to review is potentially to write off the 2014 receivable, which is about 12.8% of the total, or $83,471.96. So you're changing it from 24 months to 60 months? I'm not. You could do a whole bunch more if you wanted You're to. You're suggesting that. Yes. That's what the board has not gone all the way up to the 24-month period um, since we've adopted the policy. The closest they've got, I think, is four years. Okay. Um, and then we actually drop back another year, and that gives it some time for the deputy to go through their um, different collection procedures, and also if there's any type of litigation going on with the reason why someone took the ambulance, like a motor vehicle case or anything like that, it still gives it a chance for that bill to be mm -hmm. satisfied. So does this actually go to collections, or does this go? It'll go through the normal um, third-party bill or collection, so they'll send uh, several notices out to the patient. And then after that, it will be turned over to the deputy collector. He'll send two notices as well. And actually, they had quite a bit of movement this year with the deputy collector. They've collected over $36,000 mm, wow. um, on the ambulance bills, which is good, because gonna be my question. you don't want it to be a punitive collection policy, but also do you not want it to be that someone says, I'll just ignore it and they'll write it off in six years. So we're going to essentially write off the 83000 It's the, already, that, that already would be the, would have exhausted every... Yeah, it, it, the likelihood of you getting it without doing something more um, aggressive, such as holding up someone's permits or um, listing it on an ML, uh, a municipal lien certificate or um, saying you can't have your dump stick, your tra no, now someone else has got me saying it, your transfer station sticker or your beach <laughs> <Sorry>. sticker <laughs> if you have an outstanding ambulance, which is not... Um, somewhere that I had a sense that the board wanted to go with an, uh, an outstanding ambulance bill. What's uh, Question. More? Yeah, sorry. What's the average that we see? I mean, I see it goes from 9 to 12, but, I, you know, finally over the years when we have been abating it, is it usually around 12 percent or? This is a, a, a reasonable average for it. Um, it also depends on what's going on in, in any given year. Okay. And does it usually start up around the 40 percent mark and you, we get it down to that 12? Yeah, the, the more, as they've come more electronic, and it's almost all electronic now, um, you don't have the, the paper claims going through, and they have shorter windows. So if they have not gotten the information from the patient, sometimes they're just barred from 
um, filing a claim. Okay. Thank you. Anybody else? Those were my questions. I have a motion. Move to approve the recommended abatements for all outstanding ambulance charges from fiscal year 2014, totaling $83,471.96. Second. Second by Mr. Harris. Further discussion? Seeing none, all in favor? Aye. 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 It is unanimous. Great. The last uh, topic under scheduled items is the fiscal year 2019 year-end transfers. So now I have to put my glasses on. <laughs> um, I gave you a handout at the bottom of your packet that said use me on it because yes. it's been a lovely day for utility bills. Um, we can get oh. our utility bills online and a whole bunch of them became available and it, um, it changed the complexion of our transfers. That's a worse number. It is a worse, well it's not a worse number, it's just moving more stuff around. Okay. Um, <laughs> I did, but I'll give you another one. Um, the first set of transfers we have are to deal with uh, payroll issues. Uh, we did do one set of transfers earlier in June. I was hoping not to come back to you. And then in the final payroll of the year, we had approximately three people that left that were due buyouts from retirements as well as resignations. So the ones you see before you are for po police personal services, fire personal services, public safety communication, um, sorry, the more communication is not there, communication personal services, which is dispatch, and library personal services. In all cases, um, it's due to buyouts from uh, retirements and voluntary terminations. So by a buyout, I mean that um, someone has left the employee of the town and they're due, in some cases, a sick, um, sick leave payment or they may also usually are due some type of a vacation payment. They may have some comp time, and depending on why they left the town and, and the bargaining unit involved, there may be additional funds such as a longevity payment. Uh, the source of the funding for those would be from the town administrator personal services line item, the assessor's personal services line item, public grounds personal services, treasurer collector, and council on aging. And all of these people, uh, departments were uh, asked if they would be willing to give up their excess payroll funds and they all um, agreed to do it and they had excess payroll funds due to vacancies, unfilled positions, um, and, and the like. So those are the first grouping. Uh, the next one down is from Council on Aging Personal Services to Council on Aging Purchase of Services. Uh, the rubbish removal contract keeps going up exponentially um, at the <laughs> Council on Aging, uh, despite uh, <laughs> Linda's best efforts. So this is just to move some of her excess personal services lines down to the purchase of services line, which is contracted services, um, to address that. Go ahead, Sean. <coughs> Can you explain that a little bit? So sure. Council on Aging uses what? They use waste public? management. Okay, let's stop that right now. Town has a little rubbish packer. Have the town swing by and pick it up. They have a dumpster because they serve food. Well, that truck can pick up small dumpsters. So yep. Jim, done. <laughs> All right. Well, they have a contract or not. Well, no. Next time the contract's up, be done with it. Right? Let's look at that. That's I like easy solutions to problems. <laughs> Um, just whipping into action. <laughs> the next um, <laughs> item is from facilities, public buildings, um, line item to the library purchase of services. And we had talked before about the cost of the new buildings and the maintenance agreements. So we could have just had these bills paid by facilities and not brought them back before the board. But realistically, these are costs of operating these services at the library, and it should be part of their budget. And when their budget request comes before you next year and Jesse has a $6,000 budget and she tells you she needs a $12,000 budget, this will be why. Um, and again, I have spoken to Kevin Kelly and he uh, was willing to um, part with some of his budget funds that he didn't need or didn't have an opportunity to use for uh, reasons to assist another department with their needs as well. Um, and there's that discussion will have to be had in the fiscal 21 budget process as to whether or not these items need to be pulled out of these these departments and all consolidated under facilities or if we just have to adjust them so that we know um, where these contracts are and whether or not I would we've been talking to Kevin about looking at all the contracts and seeing if there's some type of economies of scale here that are we using multiple different vendors across the buildings that we need to adjust um, the next one is facilities public buildings to facilities natural gas old gates building so that particular um, line item is woefully um, 
insufficient. It's been being offset with the other utility lines, but with the bills that we've received as of today, uh, we do not have sufficient funds in his utility lines to uh, suffice paying all of the utility obligations that we have. Year to date for old gates, the natural gas bill is $61,000, and we still are waiting for one month's bill to come in. And we expect that to be between two and three thousand dollars. So just to give you a sense of the cost of just the natural gas up there. Um, public facility buildings to facilities, fuels, and lubricants. This is not anything that Kevin can control. His budget has the entire fuels and lubricants, so gas and diesel bill, um, budget line items for all the departments in the general fund. And if the, if the cost of gas and diesel goes down, it benefits his budget. If it doesn't go down, he's got to make up the difference. So he's making up the difference this, in this case. And the final week of the fiscal year, we had $9,400 worth of gas and diesel bills that were presented for payment. What, what um, line item is the one it's coming from? Public buildings. That's that large line item that's in the facilities budget um, that we so have. It's just one gen that's just a, a ge generic line? It's a generic line. That's the big line item in facilities. And um, normally Kevin has projects, but he hasn't been able to move forward with some of those projects for um, reasons that are known to the board. But, but this is all last year's money. Well, this is all we're all dealing with fiscal yeah. 19 right now. Yeah. So these are projects that he didn't do. He, he couldn't do. No. Couldn't do because of not because of money, because of resources, resources. man hours or whatever. Yeah. Um, and then the final one was the one I had to <coughs> add, the, um, one of the ones I had to add this afternoon um, is from the, that final public, buildi public buildings line to the street lighting electricity. And it wasn't due to the electrical costs, it was due to the repairs to the lights. So that, um, we had over $8,000 in light repairs, like to the fixtures. Hmm. We had to pay um, to multiple vendors, so that caused that um, line to go over. Right now, we're about $500 over, but uh, we're still missing a couple of utility bills. Um, so I'm just trying to play it safe on that one. So those are the end of the transfers for fiscal 19. And then the advisory committee will vote on these as well on Monday. I'm happy fiscal 20. So can we get um, a reconciliation? I think at the end of the year, you tell us all the money that's mm -hmm. left over in every department so we can oh, yeah. see the free cash. Um, Maura pointed out to me, the public grounds personnel, there's $44,000 that we had to, to give to somebody else. They had a vacancy. They no longer have that vacancy. They had it. They no longer have it. Correct. They filled, filled, it. It. filled it. Is that my extra guy to clean all the yards and stuff? No, those are the summer guys. These are the summer guys? No, we had a vacancy. The the extra help to clean all that stuff are the summer guys. And we got them? We had a long-term vacancy that we had a hard time filling. That's now been filled. That's where that money is. That's money we're transferring. I think right now DPW is going to get one open position. I yeah, I'm not even sure at this point. Yeah. I guess the only other point that, that Moore mentioned again is, you know, we had all this extra money left in this facilities. What was it like, eighty grand or something? Eighty-eight. Eighty-eight thousand dollars, and projects didn't get done. But couldn't we just have hired a temp or somebody or a, or a contractor to come in and do stuff if we had all this money? But some of that money is contingency, so you have contingency money in that line if something else happens. So if you have something like a generator repair, so one of the items that happened is in the back out there. They brought in someone to look at the generator because it wasn't operating up to par, that was about $1,900, and then they came back with it needed a $2,300 part. No, but there's $88,000 in that big lump right. sum number. We could have done something. They did do some things, but they weren't able to do everything that he had on his, on his plan for his fiscal 19 budget. I know, I guess my point is, like in March, when we knew we weren't going to do everything, could we have hired a contractor to come in and do two things? You know, some of it it's just, I mean, we just hear about the maintenance of the buildings not not getting done. I understand he's too busy to do it doing other stuff, but that's a hundred grand. There must have been some project we could have got done by hiring somebody else to do it. Yeah, um, we also missed a lot of time with Kevin. As you know, he was out. Um, Kevin was out for a long period of illness, so his department was just treading water. Yeah. 
um, and I think one of the things that I've talked to him about for the next budget is his budget, his department. Uh, we need to do a lot of work, buying some support staff and reorganizing that department. So I've told him to go back and look for the fiscal 21, mm -hmm. 21 budgets. <laughs> um, what we need to do to, to make that department more efficient. Yeah, I mean, there's just so much to be done. You hate to see it go back and a project didn't get done for another year and a half. We need a backup plan. Yeah. But any other thoughts on? Well, I just have one question about the, so all the fuels and lubricants for the entire town are paid for out of his budget? All the general facilities. fund. So the enterprise funds pay for their own. But he the rest of the town. Else, and the school department pays for their own. Okay. Just by way of saying that sometimes if people actually have to pay the bill, they're more careful. <laughs> that was the case. We had some cases, though, with departments that had larger fuels and lubricant lines that that was their go-to line when everything else, when every everything else went wrong. Okay. They, they padded their fuels and lubricants line. Okay. So we put it somewhere where it couldn't be um, touched by that many hands. <laughs> the fuels are all tracked. Each individual uses a track. Card system Card. or something. With a gas board. Card codes, yeah. It doesn't sound appropriate, but that's the name of the system. Okay. Okay. If there's no other questions, can I have a motion? Move to transfer from the available fiscal 2019 general fund budget lines as listed on the provided spreadsheet to the other fiscal 2019 general fund budget lines, a total amount of $116,473 pursuant to Mass General Law Chapter 44B, Section 33. Second by Ms. Curran. Further discussion? Seeing none. All in favor? Aye. 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 It's unanimous. Great. Thank you, Nancy. Thank you. It's crunch time for you, right? This is... Awesome. New business we're going to discuss and finalize the uh, liaison positions we talked about last week, I asked that we sleep on it and make sure that somebody didn't get too many or somebody didn't get enough. Sleep on. Is everyone happy with theirs? Well, I have a question. More? Do you like your two? I have more than two, for the record. <laughs> now, you'd like me to read them aloud, <laughs> <laughs> Miss Conley? Yes, since the um, Affordable Housing Trust has a member of the Board of Selectmen on their board as a voting member, I would just suggest that I think a liaison is kind of redundant, and in which case I would be glad to take something else on. But I just feel as though why should a BOS member go to observe another BOS member Who's the voting as part member? of the committee? Hmm? Me. Okay. Maura. What do you And it, it caused a little confusion because the, the when I sent out my little notification that I'm their new liaison, I'm like, what's happening tomorrow? No, so, so it doesn't, yeah, I, nobody's ever been confused in the past. Well, they were. Um, uh, I'm just no, saying. Nobody got an email in the past. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh. <laughs> well, no, and Sean would go every once in a while, you know, if there was a big issue, um, do whatever you want. I mean, I, I don't. Well, I'm not trying to get out of it. I'm just suggesting that. I think it's redundant, and if I can relieve someone else on another committee, I'm happy to do it. If not, then... Yes, it makes sense. Let's take you off that. And well, let's eliminate that, yeah. Yeah. Liaison position. Do we need and to vote on eliminating I don't do and liaison? <laughs> do we need to vote on eliminating a liaison position? Oh. Yeah. 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 Does anyone have... Karen, it's the only liaison that has you've a got a ton of them. It's, it's, no, it, but it's, it's not, I'm not the liaison. So the trust is written in a manner, we don't have to go into it right now because it's late, but the trust document right. is written in a manner that a board of selectmen is a member of the trust. So right. I'm not the liaison to right. tell That's the board what's going on, even though I do, it, you're actually a voting participating member of right. the trust. So That's why I think to your point, it's, if it's redundant, then it's a liaison position that doesn't need to exist. Also, Correct. You don't have to do anything. I'm fine. It's good. I you know what you would be great at, Karen? What? 
You would be great. <laughs> <laughs> the I can just Smith <laughs> County Advisory Board. Oh, yeah. Oh. Isn't that always the chair? That is a fun <laughs> How often do they meet? Just curious. Maybe Joan will still go. <laughs> <laughs> no, Hopefully. no. It's not, so it's not even why one don't we just leave it the way it is now, take right. that off, and then we can discuss amongst ourselves if we want to swap one. All right, so I don't think we need a vote on that. We'll say that's finalized. Um, the next item is discussion vote on one day wine and malt licenses. Okay. Can I ask a question before I read the motion? Yep. Is that an approved caterer? The black. Yes. Oh, wow. Okay. Who? Oh. 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 Just oh, don't recognize right. the name. Who the board of selectmen approve a one-day wine and malt license to the black apron for an event at the Citroen Maritime Center on July 10th, 2019, from noon time to 3 p.m. for an event on August 10th. 2019 from 5:30 to 9:30 p.m. It's gotten a little so close. <laughs> well, they, got two? they have two of them. So yeah. Seven, ten. But one's at the end. One's at what? One's at the end. It is. It does it's say. It. Yeah, it's typed wrong. So the or well, one of them's wrong. Are they both at this Maritime Center, Lorraine, or is one at the end? Uh, let's see. One's the Citroen. One is at the Citroen Maritime Center on uh, August 10th. Well, one's. July 10th and one's August 10th. Yeah, so the July 10th and one's at the inn. And it's situated higher. Okay. All right, so amend that to reflect the inn on 7 they're, they're on to yeah. back up yeah. in a different order than they're on the agenda, that's all. Well, the, so yeah, the agenda the shows the one at the situated yes, inn there. first oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, right. and the one for the maritime center. I was reading them both. It this, the, the motion says they're both at the same right. right. So. All right, so was that all set, Lorraine? <laughs> yeah. Tony's amendment. Thank as you. amended. Seconded as amended. Second by Scanfield. For the discussion, seeing none, all in favor? Aye. 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 It is unanimous. Great. Are there any liaison reports? Uh, do we need minutes? Oh, uh, I have a couple. One. Karen. Oh. I only have one. No, I have two. I lied. <laughs> so first, it's liaison reports. Do you have any, Karen? Yeah, um, I was at the CPC meeting last night. They have currently in hand five applications. Um, a couple of them may not pass muster in terms of their suitability for CPC funds. A couple look pretty promising. Um, there's been no determination as to whether any of them or all of them or none of them would go to the special town meeting of the fall or to the regular town meeting in April. Um, and. Uh, applicants still have until October 1st to file applications to go to the town meeting in the spring. So who knows what's going to happen, but there's five. So. Is, one one is, is, is that one of them again? What? Sorry. Uh, <laughs> I was going to ask, was the beach commission one of them? Yes. I mean, no, I'm sorry, the North Situate Beach, uh, North Situate yes. group, one of them? Yes, North Situate was there. Um, 436 Chief Justice Cushing Highway, which is the house that's down on the reservoir, was on uh, mm. the docket. Uh, the agriculture people who, um, you know, want to do something over in Bassings Harbor, they're calling it. Um, that's questionable as to whether or not, yeah. because it's a for-profit entity, whether or not CPC could do it. But I, I suggested last night that Waterways has an enterprise fund, and they might be much more appropriate, but of course Waterways doesn't want to give them money. So I said, well, go ask them again. Give them money for what? To do um, boundaries and markers and they put down. Were, but EDC has given them money. They gave them money to do right. some engineering. And now they actually are looking for money to actually put the markers in and do the boundaries, et cetera. Yeah. So they've got a long way to go. Yeah. And yeah, they're, they're, moving, they're moving. I'll be talking to them tomorrow night. They they want to fast track this. They they may want to, but right. there are real questions as to. I mean, it's, it would be a profit make. People would be making You're right. money. You're right. And so, but we own the fields. Right. And we collect rent though. You only get twenty five bucks a dollars. year for the twenty five dollars a license. <laughs> I do. I yeah. know. Right. Twenty five dollars a license. Um there's a piece of property on Country Way that is next to the uh, reservoir. They only want twenty thousand dollars, whereas the other property wants something like four hundred and fifty thousand well, dollars. Uh, four thirty six, that's a house. Um yeah. 
It's a house. For sale. Yeah. Okay. And Morning. lots of discussion about how much that is and whether or not we would even consider it and why would we want to buy a house and could it be moved. I mean, it, it provoked it's, a lot of discussion. It's an antique. But it's, it's a lot of money. It needs a septic system. Right. But if we buy that, we should buy the one across the street and then we should buy them all around this. Well, right. I mean, you know, in fact, there are so many over overlaps in terms of zoning regulations on that property alone. I mean... What's the address? 436. That's the it's antique the little cape. cape. It's got a really right rickety fence, fence in front of it. What? Chief, Chief Justice Chief. Cushing Highway. Oh. It's right on the reservoir. Yep, I know it doesn't even... Uh, just to a yeah. layman, it doesn't look like it's buildable, cool. but... Oh, oh, the house itself? No, I mean that the, the land doesn't have all kinds of problems. I don't know. People occupied it uh, part-time. Yeah. So, um, so, and then a mile marker um, project. We have three of them in situate. They're those granite things that are like on Country Way mm -hmm. all the way up, and they need to be restored. So, uh, and I guess there are about 80 of them that go from Boston all the way down to the Cape. So that there used be to be one at my corner a gazillion years ago until some car took it out and then I don't know I don't know where it is. Love to find that. No, it's not. <laughs> if it were, I take it out. It's not. <laughs> <laughs> and to finish up, the North Situate people did come in and they received a very, I think, uh, encouraging uh, welcome from the board because I think we all. All of us think North Situate needs a lot of help, mm -hmm. and this would sort of make the canopy even more useful than it is now. It's, it looks nice, the, the roof, but it could be used in a much better way. So, but we're at the beginning of the process, uh, as CPC is at the beginning of the process. Uh, people will have plenty of time to comment. Hey, more? Um, so just with CPC, with the two open positions <coughs> and it being crunch time, are do we have applications uh, for that committee, and can we get them on the docket sooner or later? Yeah, Lorraine's pulling all that together. Yeah, I just didn't know. I know you get a ton, but. Well, people gave till July 9th, they extended Yeah, so last meeting we extended it, so. All right, we so talked to today. So next meeting she's going to go through and see okay. if anyone needs it, and they'll be coming in earlier than the others. Good. Well, the good news is they have a quorum, easy, okay. um, for the time being, but. There's a couple of people potentially moving on. Anything else, Maura? No, the only other for liaison, I mean, you have it in correspondence, but um, the Coastal Advisory Commission is organizing a public forum um, to, as part of the entire analysis and consultation that took place in the past year. Um, so on July 30th, so you don't have to read it during correspondence, um, from 6.30 to 8 at the library. Um, it's just to sort of highlight the grants that we've gotten, the progress that we've made, what the next steps are, and to start engaging the public a little bit more in our coastal issues to continue to move forward and prioritize and go down the next steps. So I think it's a great opportunity for people to learn what we've done and what we still need to do. Right. Will you be attending? I, I think it's important one of us is yeah. there, so. Karen? Maybe. Anything? Uh, just one thing, it's very exciting, the master plan um, public kickoff meeting is going to be held Tuesday, August 13th at 6.30 at the Gates Middle School. Um, the board, the planning board and the planning development department um, will have save the date messages out and, you know, we'll do all we can to uh, let people know about that process. Um, it's being facilitated by um, the um, consultant who is helping guide the launch of this. Um, there was a um, preliminary meeting uh, that went real that was very exciting that a lot of really good contributions so this is this is the first sort of put it out there and tell people what we want to learn and what the timeline is going to be for the next 12 months as we work towards the master plan so August 13th Sean mm -hmm. great well, let's move on to minutes can I have a motion to accept the minutes Some for our meeting of June 25th 2019 so moved. Second by Mr. Harris. Further discussion? Seeing none, all in favor? Aye. Aye. It's unanimous. And lastly, um, any other correspondence? Uh, yes. It was just that uh, okay. Morris covered it. That was it. Great. Um, what was one thing? 
on the upcoming events, I thought. Oh, the carnival. Isn't the carnival start tonight? The fireworks for my birthday? <laughs> Starts tonight? Yes. Is your birthday today? No, the fireworks. Friday. I do them on my birthday on Saturday. Saturday. Friday and Saturday. Birthday. Okay, so the carnival is starting tonight and this weekend, and Karen's birthday is Saturday. <laughs> <laughs> Where you wear, where you wear the minutes stick. reflect. Yes, you're welcome. Right. <laughs> 50, the big five. There's a party at her house. I'll be at carnival. And uh, there's a car show coming up on 718 and 815. Um, great. With that being said, uh, I can have a motion to adjourn and sign documents. So moved. Second by Mr. Harris. All in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you. Thank you. I'm so glad we you have to go to bed now. <laughs>